I got like the coolest idea. This is in standard E. It's basically uh, like an F sharp minor and like a B minor type thing. It's really simple, but something like I want to know so much more than just your name. I want to hold you close enough to smell your hair. I saw you from across the way, the way the light lit your face. I'm not sure, but I think I found my wife. I feel something deep inside my bones. I can't know for sure, but I think I found my home. I feel something so deep inside my bones. I can't know for sure, but I think I found my home. Then, then the girl part comes in. That's basically J Julie singing um, something like, you know, um, yeah. I see you looking over at me. You got those lying eyes, but there's something true to see. Or something like that. You got much to prove, just like most guys. <laughs> Something true when I'm looking in your eyes. And then we both sing into it. Cause I feel something deep inside my bones. I can't know for sure, but I think I found my own. Something like that. Then. We do a music video for it where it's like a split screen and it's a side profile of me on one side and a side profile of her on the other and we're singing this thing looking at each other the whole time but we're walking so that the backgrounds and stuff are changing from like day to night and that type of thing the whole song and then at the end of the song it's us the split screen dissolves or whatever and it's us embracing each other and kind of dancing to this. That's my idea. I want to know so much more than just your name. to smell your hair I saw you from across the way The way the light lit your face I'm not sure but I think I I found my wife I feel something so deep inside my bones I can't know for sure but I think I found my home I feel something so Inside my bones I can't know for sure But I think I found my
There will be no encores. There will be none. My pride died in that video. If you need deliverance from pride, we got you. If you believe in recreative miracles, you're watching one right now. It's like we just sang that song and hair just started sprouting out. <laughs> Come on, somebody. I gotta, I gotta put this away. This, here Man, how are you guys down. feeling tonight? <laughs> we have such an awesome night. Pastor Mike, Pastor Mike, why don't you tell us what are we doing next? <laughs> Well, first of all, I want to say welcome to all 18 locations that are simulcasting yes. around the United States. Come on, here in New York, let's get extra loud for Miami. Come on, let me hear you, V1 Miami. Come on, let me hear you. Canada is watching. Toronto, we see you. California. Northwest I Indiana, we love you, and we're so excited that you're here. Guys, yeah. uh, not only do we have a completely packed out space of Westbury here on Long, Long Island, but we actually have 18 locations simulcasting. And so tonight we got some uh, surprises in, in store for every single one of you, but yeah. I believe that whether you're married or single, tonight is going to be your night. Amen. Okay, let's do this. Do I have any single people in any of our spaces right now? Wave the wristband. Wave the wristband. Let everybody see. Woo! Okay, look around. Look around. Look around. Look around. Look around. <laughs> Across every location, we are facilitating dreams coming to pass. You still, had, you still had my hair from the music video. <laughs> Um, but married folks, it's going to be amazing. I have my good friends, pastors Vlad and Lana here from Hungry Gen, all the way from Washington State. And it's so good. Let me get my iPad. It's somewhere back there if you guys Man, want to bring I'll it to me. I'll tell you what you can definitely expect. I won't be singing any more of those cheesy 80 rock songs. <laughs> that's for sure. You won't, you won't have any of that. So if you're like, what did I walk into? Well, here's you're in what for I want to encourage time. you to do tonight. I want, you, I want to encourage you to let your guard down. I went, we used to go to these marriage conferences, and we were on the verge of divorce, and I would sit there angry the entire time, and I felt like it was a hijack, and my wife convinced me to come, and I didn't want to be there. So if you're here, and you don't want to be here, can I just tell you, I, I get it. I know how that feels, yeah. but I also believe in divine appointments. And I also believe that God can speak something to you that can change your life and your marriage forever. And it was at marriage conferences just like this that God healed and restored our marriage. So yes. we're going to kick off the first session. Do I have any note takers in the house tonight? All right. So we love to learn. So get ready to take some notes. And we're going to jump into this session. I would like to invite you over to my house. You want to come over to my yeah. house? Yeah. yeah. Can I sit on the same couch or do I have to sit separate? Yeah, girl, I'm thinking we okay. sit on the same couch. Okay. All right. Calm okay. down. We didn't get a gift bag. <laughs> Go ahead. Get your, make yourself comfortable. Make so yourself can, comfortable. Can, yes, okay. please. please, right, please, thank, please. You, thank you. Thank you. So the first year of this marriage conference, we were on Long Island, and we had this vision for these guest bags that included um, what, some items that we thought could enhance a married couple's life. And it was a joke. It was a total gag. And we had, uh, I don't know if this is going to get flagged on YouTube, but we had like condoms and <laughs> lubrication. And <laughs> okay. well, well, listen, there's no kids ministry tonight. And if you brought your kid, <laughs> it's going to be real weird. <laughs> so earmuffs. True that, <laughs> this is true an that, adult true event. That. Amen. True that. And so the very first event we had, we, we were like, let's put out these bags and then you could put the things that you want in there. And it was strictly, we thought a joke. Within the first eight minutes of the event, the, the V1 church folks ransacked the entire buffet of married folks' excitement. Yes, <laughs> even the churchies, even all the churchy yeah. folk. Yep. And, and we realized that it was not a joke to them. It was real. And then nine months later... <laughs> I'm, I'm, am I lying? Oh, you, if Nine you know, months you later, know. we had to do so many baby dedications. And, and we made a mistake. We made one more mistake that very first year of the marriage conference. I rented a huge hotel, and we blocked out every room of this hotel. And it was the loudest night they have ever encountered. 
And it was not deliverance. It was another kind of freedom, though. And people were screaming in the whole hotel. And, and the workers, no one got any sleep. And we came out, and it was the most awkward morning session. The next day when awkward. we came together and everyone's looking at each other like, I feel like we got way too close on this. Man. I don't know if any original V1 people were at that oh, event. Oh, you know. Anybody. You know. So tonight, you. we do not have a hotel across any of our 18 locations, although we would encourage you to find one on the way home if that's what your marriage needs. Amen? Okay, so um, I'm also going to ask, and I want to set some ground rules because we're going to jump into this first session, but I'm going to ask that we can all keep it 100. Tell your neighbor, keep it 100. All right. We're going to have to get vulnerable. We're going to have to get real and transparent. Can we all make our minds up that we're going to do that tonight? Okay. Are we all on the same page with that? Second ground rule. I have to be able to talk about some things that are also found in the Song of Solomon. <laughs> oh, my gosh. We're going there. And there's always going to be some religious people who probably have the worst love life ever who are going to be so religious that they make us feel bad for discussing things that are in the scriptures. Sex is in the scriptures. I'm a pastor, and I believe that Christians should have the best sex life on the planet because God invented sex. It was God's idea, no matter what the world tries to do with it. And we got to be willing to talk about some stuff tonight. Is that all right? Talk about it. Girl, I will, because that one time when me oh, and... All right. We don't, we don't need to do that. So tonight's going to be vulnerable, transparent, real. We're going to laugh together. We're going to cry together. But many of us came from families where these conversations never happened or were not allowed. And so as a spiritual father and a spiritual mother, we want to step into the conversation. And, and here's the last thing I'm going to say. Ground rule number three. I believe that God can do three years worth of marriage counseling in one night tonight. I'm not trying to undermine the effectiveness of long-term marriage counseling because we did that. But, I, but there is a time where the Lord will accelerate and expedite something and he'll allow something to happen in one night. You know, the cross was one moment, but it was one moment that healed every moment that came before it. So we can make a moment tonight that heals many moments that came before it. Okay, so You're tonight, teaching. just lock in with me. So I'm going to start with prayer, get your notes out, and then we're going to jump into this first session. Let's do it. Heavenly Father, yes, I thank God. you for what only you can do tonight. God, I thank you that you use the brokenness of Julie and I's marriage to become healing for many other marriages. God, you take the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And it's people who don't know what they're doing. But Holy Spirit, you said, I will teach you all things. And that includes sex. That includes the fidelity of marriage. That includes how to get together and reconcile and heal a marriage. Holy Spirit, you will teach us all things tonight. And Father, I thank you that before the end of this night, you will have your way and freedom across all 18 locations. Okay, I just feel led to say this. For people who were divorced and they never thought that they would experience love again, but God, you're doing something in their heart. For single people who lost hope, but something happens in their life tonight. For married people who thought, I'm only gonna have a mediocre marriage, but they see that they can actually have the marriage, not of their dreams, but of your dreams, God. And everybody shouted, amen, amen, amen. 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 So this first session that we're going to do, and it's going to be a brief session to kick it off, is sometimes in order to go forward, you have to go backward. Sometimes in order to go forward, you guys just saw Pastor Mike, full head of hair, major beard, 2010. We had to go backward to go forward. And there was like a really ridiculously hilarious dream that that version of me had about this crazy music video with me and Julie. But it wasn't until many years later that I had the resources and the staff and the cameras and the ability to fulfill even a stupid dream. And so sometimes you have to go back to go forward. Sometimes things take time, amen? 
And so I really believe that there's many of you that God brought you to this place tonight he, across all of these 18 locations to remind you of the vision that he gave you when you first met your spouse. Because I'm going to be talking to the married folks and the single people, you're just allowed to hear all this tonight, okay? And this will be a down payment on your marriage. Amen. But you've got, but let me just say this, men, we have vision. We have the ability to envision the very first time you, you saw your wife, you envisioned her naked. Praise God. Oh God. And all the men said amen. amen. I'm not saying it was right, but you had vision. You had vision. And even if she rejected you multiple times, like how Julie rejected me the first five times I asked you out, I had a vision that said she will be my wife and that vision was so strong and so potent that even though she rejected me the first five times, the vision was saying no, that continue to persist. And I wore you down. We got coffee. I made you laugh so hard, coffee came out of your nose. <laughs> Some of you single people, the reason why you're, why you're still single is because you're not funny. <laughs> Stop dumping your problems on the first date and oversharing. You look like a weirdo. Well, well. And then some of you married people that's like, man, why is my marriage? Like, listen, have fun in your marriage. Become a best friend. And really for Julie, the first time that she allowed me to take her on this date and we were laughing together, it was like she then, when, it, when she was laughing and that, that coffee, that Starbucks came through her nostrils, she blew her nose and then she looked up at me. And she was like, I think I found him. <laughs> so she started to get vision. Maybe he is my husband. And see, when you start with that vision, the vision that leads you down the aisle to get married is not a vision of you suffering in your physical body with physical illness. It's not a vision of you living in poverty and scraping by and not being able to pay your bills. It's not a vision of you be having a sexless marriage where you guys you know, have no passion. That's not what got you to that aisle or this ju justice of the peace, depending on where you were at in that season of your life. But the vision that you had was this is going to be, do you remember when we used to get together and we would say, man, one of these days we're never gonna have to be apart? Oh, yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, do you want me to talk about it? Well, I just thought, I was so into what you were saying. I was like, <laughs> I'm learning. Well, well, the vision, I think for us, it was like I had vision for you, you did not have vision for me. I broke through that barrier. <laughs> then you had vision for me. And then we were just obsessively with each other and it was like we could not get married fast enough, yep. and that was part of the vision. So I want to go back. A lot of times when couples come to us for marriage counseling and they're on the verge of divorce, the very first thing Julie and I do is we say, tell us how you first decided that you wanted to get married. And when people start to share that story, it rekindles that fire and that passion, and we start seeing tears well up, and then grace begins to flow. Humility comes over these people, and then they look at each other, and they go back. You know, David, when he fought Goliath, had to go back and rehearse. He delivered me out of the paw of the lion and the bear. Surely you'll deliver me from the hand of this uncircumcised Philistine. Sometimes the way that you kill that big giant in front of you is remembering the little victories you you had before it came. And so it was like, sometimes when we, when we meet with people, the way that we'll cancel a divorce is saying, but wait a second, there was a time where it wasn't always like this. Mm -hmm. There was a time where, where things did work. And so what was it like for you in those early days with like the vision that we had for our marriage? Because it wasn't soon after we got married that all that vision crumbled. Yeah, so you're talking about, okay. So when we first got together, I remember, okay, so we were dating, right? We were in college. And um, he was obsessed with me. <laughs> Rar. <laughs> like, put the wig on again. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so he just wanted to be, like, we wanted to be around each other all the time. But then, like, over time, I wanted that same thing. And so I remember I was in college, and he was getting ready to go away to school uh, you know, back to college, and I, you know, went to college near my house, and so we were going to be apart, and I was just like, I would just think about it, and just thinking about it, I would have like one singular tear. Y'all know that Taylor Swift moment, you know what I'm saying, when you're like, you, the song comes on the radio, and you're like, I am her right now, 
Like, I'm desperate, you know, to be together. And so um, I was getting ready to go on a vacation, and so it was going to put us apart a few days earlier than, you know, whatever, because it was the way our family vacation fell. Well, there was a hurricane, and I was so happy that our vacation got canceled because I got to be, like, there, the whole world was in crisis, and I didn't even care because I was so in love. I was just like, oh, I'm so glad we get a couple more days. It's like, who thinks like that? Like, I wasn't even thinking like a human being, you know? I was so self-centered. But it's you're, when you're in love and, and it's new and it's fresh, you forget about all the calamity around you. You don't think about not having any money. You don't think about, you know, um, a toilet being broke. And what happens, I think, the familiarity in marriage, you start treating your spouse as familiar as That's you treat it. your couch, when you first got that couch, what did you tell your kids? Don't you eat on that couch. <laughs> Fast forward five years, you are wiping the barbecue sauce <laughs> off on the side of the couch where you put the pillow. Y'all know who's with me. And so it's like we get into those seasons of familiarity and all of a sudden the newness of our love it, it got to a point in our marriage where I never wanted him to come home. I would pray, I hope he never comes home. I think you would pray, I hope he dies. I did. And that, that's a true story. I, I would literally pray, Lord, I, I hope, it, it's horrible. I hate to even say it, but that was really where my heart was, is I was like, God, I hope he just gets like, I don't know, hit by something. Or, because I didn't want to deal with the reality of what our life was like. I didn't want to face it. I was so broken from everything that had happened, and we had become so familiar to one another, and we really had to go back to that, um, that newness. Yeah. And that's intentional. That's not a feeling. And so even to this day, I'll buy things that have like a little M on them. And it's like, I'm 40. But I don't want it to get too familiar. Because if I was in high school, I'd be buying it. If I was in college, I'd be buying it. And so my effort is I don't ever want, you know, um, my kids' little crushes and things to be more exciting than God's gift to me. This is my gift. My treasure. And so I want that to be as exciting. And so it might look funny to you. I, I literally do not care. Take a hike. Because this is my treasure. We had to learn what you rehearse is what you repeat. You rehearse the pain, you repeat the pain. Come on. If you rehearse the trauma, you repeat the trauma. What you rehearse is what you repeat. And so we could just say, you hurt me, you hurt me, you hurt me. And every single time we rehearse the hurt, we repeat the hurt. But see, what happens was she said, well, I'm going to rehearse the, the beginnings of our relationship. I'm going to rehearse the times where we got along. And then I'm going to repeat what I rehearse. And so I'm going to act like a girlfriend so I can have girlfriend feelings. I, I'm going to act like a boyfriend so we can have boyfriend feelings. Do you remember the very first time that you actually held their hand? And it felt like electricity shooting through your body. Come on, girl. I do. You know, so everybody here knows what I'm talking about. You're thinking about that right now. Okay, let's take it a step further. Do you remember the very first time that you kissed? Okay, that's somebody's just somebody's awkwardly a giggling great in the front. Over there. And I'm like, y'all are enjoying this way too much. The, I can't but even. the very first time that you kissed and you were like, because here's the thing, even on a biological level, your body knew this is it. Did you know that, that the body knows there's a chemistry, there's pheromones, there's hormones. This is so wired, and God is intimately weaving that story together. Can I just tell you that God created marriage so there's a special blessing on marriage? This was God's idea. When, when Adam was walking through the garden and said, God, I need companionship, God did not say, spend more time with me, Adam. You need to fast. You need to pray more. He actually said, I know you need a wife. 
And so sometimes God's prescription for us men is not even you need to pray more, it's you need a companion. I know that desire that is gonna be fulfilled by your Eve. And so God has destined us, unless you have the gift of singleness, to actually be joined together in oneness, and there's a special blessing. Did you know that the most wealth-generating institution on the planet is the marriage? Did you guys know that? More wealth is generated by virtue of the institution of marriage than any other institution on planet Earth. And so wealth is transferred. Legacy is created. So now you see why all hell breaks loose against a marriage because if the two will become one and begin to do what God called them to do, then they are unstoppable. Matter of fact, when Jesus compares the, his, his bride, he, it's, it's a wedding allegory because there's such an imagery between the groom and the bride and it's so important that you get that revelation. But to go forward, you gotta go back. The first Adam failed. And so God said, I must send my son Jesus as the second Adam. I've got to go back to where it failed. It failed on planet Earth. So I've got to now send my son to the same place of pain. Are, are you getting this? So good. And so guess what? Sometimes it's not finding another spouse. It's the same spouse healing the pain that they created. I'm trying to help somebody here. The first Adam failed, and so God didn't send us uh, um, an elephant. He didn't send us, come on, somebody, a penguin. It wasn't another species. It was humanity failed, so another man must come to redeem humanity. So what will happen is sometimes you think, well, I need to find another spouse, but it's like the person who has the capacity to heal you the most from the wounds of your spouse is your spouse. That's redemption. And so what Julie and I were learning is you've got to go backward to go forward. First Corinthians chapter three, verse 11 says, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Men, can I talk to you for a second? Okay, you're being real quiet. Men, men, I want you to go back to the vision that you had of starting a family leading your home, building a legacy. I want you to go back to the vision that you had. Men, I'm not calling you out. I'm calling you up higher now. Listen, a woman will miscarry a baby, but a man will miscarry a dream. A, a woman will miscarry. We had two miscarriages. Julie and I had two miscarriages, and I remember the tragedy of losing that baby, and I, I remember the second time it happened, and that baby had to be surgically removed from my wife. But see, I haven't experienced that, but I've experienced the miscarriage of a dream. And so many of you men, you had an expectation, and that expectation miscarried. And you're like, I didn't expect my wife to be nagging me all the time. I didn't expect for, you know, because a lot, a lot of what I'm saying right now is psychological. You know, the wife is the psycho and then the man is the logical. <laughs> psychological. It took a turn. I just wanted to make sure you're still with me. You know, psychological. Oh, they're with you. <laughs> so a lot of times you're like, this makes sense in my logical mind. Why is it not making sense to her? Why are we arguing all the time? Why are we fighting all the time? Where's the passion gone? You know, and then her body changes after kids and it's not the same woman that you married physically. And then you get into the trap of scrolling through Instagram. I'm keeping it 100. But men, I wanna go back to the original vision because the woman that you're looking at on Instagram does not deserve your eyes, especially the fact that her body hasn't borne your babies. So never give a woman attention that hasn't gone through the pain of bearing your babies. And so what happens is we end up in this world where we're like, I'm not sexually satisfied in my marriage, so I'm gonna satisfy myself. And men, we, you did not get married for that. You, the vi and I'm calling you back to that vision because the Bible actually says in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12, hope deferred makes the heart sick but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. 
So I want God to exchange heart sickness for a tree of life. We talk about a family tree, and you trace your lineage into that family tree. Many of you have never inherited a godly, godly tree in your family because hope deferred, you actually inherited heart sickness. You've actually got, you know, they, when you go to the doctor, they'll tell you, they'll say, what, well, do you have a family history of heart disease? And for many of you men, you have inherited a spiritual genetic heart disease, and you're hope has gone deferred and the generations that have gone before you have been one mediocre marriage after another and you've got to become the generational curse breaker that says the heart sickness ends with me and can I just tell you something about your wife's body it's a reflection of your words to her because if you begin to prophesy to your wife, I'll never forget, you know, can, can I tell your story? Uh, you're going to tell it and anyway, it so back to I you. don't know what you're going to say. You know, after, so my <laughs> wife had Bella, and then she had a miscarriage, and there was weight gain and different things, and I remember being in my young 20s, and I remember being angry. Man, when I married Julie, she was so hot, da, da, da. She's let herself go. I'm so mad at her. And I'll never forget the Holy Spirit just convicted me so deeply. And he said, Mike, he said, your wife's body is a reflection of your words. You've abused your wife. You've spoken down. She's severely depressed. You're supposed to be the high priest of your home. You've got to go back to go forward. You've got to pray with her like you used to pray with her. You've got to prophesy to your wife. You've got to begin to speak in. Mike, you've lost the vision. When did you become so cruel? The old you would drive four hours, because me and Julie live 200 miles apart. You would drive four hours, 200 miles, take her out for dinner and drive four hours back. And now you won't even go pick her something out and pick her something up to eat. And she's now transformed. Julie is not gaining the weight because she's a bad person. She lost vision for her life. She's depressed. And it's your job to speak that vision. And I begin to prophesy over you. I begin to speak in your life. And then all of a sudden, Julie transformed in that season into a triathlete. But I heard the Lord say to somebody, there is still time, but you must go backward to go forward. When you first spoke to your wife, you didn't discourage her, you encouraged her. You were her biggest cheerleader. When you first got married, you had hope, you had, you had this desire to, and you had a future and God's gonna take you back to that place. And I think women, we have to, we have to allow space for them to be different. And here's how this looks in real life. You pray to God, Lord, soften his heart, right? Y'all pray this prayer. Change him. He's a psycho. I had to get you back for that one line. <laughs> <laughs> he won't stop cussing. Bleh. And he comes home from work. You're still angry. He goes to grab your hand and you pull it away. Well, you, we didn't even talk about it. But you just rejected a bid for intimacy, a bid for emotional intimacy, yeah. a bid for change. And so a lot of times us women, we, they start making um, strides to be different. And, and if you're in a functional marriage, good for you. You get the award. I'm so happy for you. But I was in crazy dysfunction. So if you're, who's the kind of people who threw plates? Oh, hey, okay. Deliver her, Lord. It probably was him. I don't know. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. All right, I'm going to talk to my people then because y'all churchy over here. But like we would throw some, somebody broke something Every single Saturday. I love to punch holes in the wall. Yes. And, and one time you punched that one hole that had the cement wall, and I was like, good. You can't Hulk smash cement, you can't. guys. <laughs> yeah. But this is us being real because I'm being real. at that season in our life, we were ordained. Yeah. We were ministering, preaching to people, praying, but we had the fruits of the flesh, not the fruits, fruits of the of spirit. The flesh. And so... 
we were stuck in a cycle. It's like even when he would try, I would just shut him down so hard. And I'm not talking about even intimacy. I'm talking about like, how was your day? Well, why are you asking about my day? I was, you never asked about my day all week. Am I, am I speaking to somebody? And so as women, somebody has to be the redeemer. Stop waiting for them. Yeah, come on. You don't have to wait. You know, well, it's 50-50. No, it ain't. The cross was not 50-50. I'll go to the cross if you repent. That's not Jesus. Jesus said, I'm going all the way whether you come or not. I'm going all the way because I'm in it. I am so in this thing. And sometimes with our marriage, women, let go of the past. I'll never forget it. If you've been stuck in a rehearse before, have you ever been that, the replay? I'm telling you, one day I was in church, in church, and the replay was just going out. We weren't lead pastors or nothing. We were just serving our local church. And, and, the, and the replay is just going in my head of what was said and what was done. And this woman of God, Adele, thank you, Lord, came up to me. She looked at my eyes. And, and mind you, I'm just putting bulletins out, okay? I'm not doing anything serious. She looked at me and she said, the Lord told me to tell you what's done is done. Let it go. And it silenced the voice of the enemy. And from that day, I thought, anytime he makes an effort, I'm going all the way. Yeah. Here's the thing. I feel the, the anointing so strongly. It's time to go back. You're going to go back before you go forward. If, now, listen, I'm talking to the women right now. Men are like mirrors. If you look into the mirror like this, a man will... If you look in the mirror and you're like, mm-hmm, a man will go, mm-hmm, <laughs> Men are like mirrors. What if I told you that if Julie's body was a reflection of my words, my behavior was a reflection of her behavior? Because Ju I would come home not realizing my wife prayed these satanic prayers that I would get into a car accident <laughs> on the way there. And so when I walked in the door, Julie wasn't saying, come on, come on, come on inside. Julie was looking at me like this. What you sow is what you reap. And it creates a cycle. So Julie's look at me, looking at me, and here's the thing. If you treat your man like his past, he will manifest his past over and over and over again. If you treat him like the future, he will begin to manifest the vision that God showed him from the beginning because men are visual. And that's why pornography has wrecked the lives of so many men because it's not supposed to be pornography. It's supposed to be the prophetic. And if we are visual, that means we're visionaries. And that means that we can be in poverty but have a vision for our family that it's going to be from poverty to legacy. It means that we can have a vision where we can see that we can find finally actually have the family that we know that God's called you to. And so if the visual canceled our sexuality and canceled our hope and canceled our dream, it's the vision that'll resurrect it. So right now in this place, this is your wife. There are six or seven billion people on the planet. You said no to three billion women to say yes to one. That's your wife. That's the mother of your children. Did you know that science tells us that when you impregnate a woman, that there's stem cells from that baby that actually travel throughout the woman's body and end up in her brain and actually begins to intertwine with her neurons? Meaning that the, that the DNA of the father even begins to entwine with the brain of the mother. There's a oneness. If you have not divorced and you're sitting in that seat and you think that you're done, I want to remind you this is your bride. This is your bride. You got to go back. And God's going to take you on a supernatural journey in the spiritual realm back to that moment. And he's going to restore the years that the locust and the canker worm and the palmer worm have eaten. 
God is going to redeem every single situation. And mark my words. And we're, listen, we're getting ready for the next session. We're getting ready to pray in a few moments. But mark my words. Some of the things that you thought were going to destroy your marriage are going to become a weapon that's forged in your hands. Because see, first David, he rehearsed the victories of the past so that he could repeat a victory in the present. And he walked up to Goliath and took the same sword that Goliath was going to try to use to kill him. And he cut Goliath's head off and killed Goliath with his own sword. Everything that almost destroyed Julie and I's marriage becomes content for every conference for the rest of our lives. That's what redeem means. Redeem means that you come out of this conference tonight and you look your spouse in the eye and you say, I didn't think it was possible until tonight, but all of this becomes our testimony now. Oh, I feel the presence of God. You've got to go back to go forward. So grab this, the hand of your spouse right now. And just hold their hand across all 18 locations. Every spouse, just hold their hand. Just close your eyes to remove all distractions. Do you remember? Whew. Do you remember the first time you held this hand? This is your wife, this is your husband. If you're willing to go back and say, I, I, I want to go back to the beginning, I, I'm willing to go back. My body's changed, my mind's changed, my situation's changed. We've been through a lot, but I'm willing to go back. Would you just squeeze the hand of your spouse right now to tell them, I'm, I'm willing to go back? Somebody's being healed right now because they never thought that they would feel that squeeze. Come on, somebody wanted to do it, but you let pride get in the way. I'm gonna give you one more chance. If you're willing to go back, if you're willing to go back, just squeeze their hand now. Come on, let me pray. Father, I've done many, many marriage ceremonies, and we say this line, what God, what you join together, let no man divide. And Father, I thank you that something happened. For some of us, it was months ago, years ago, when we joined together with our spouse and you brought us to this place, God, to take us back. And Lord, I thank you that if we felt the passion once, we can feel it again. If we felt the love once, we can feel it again. If we said it once, we can say it again. We are capable of going back. And Lord, I thank you that right now you're healing. You're freeing. You're breaking all the chains of unforgiveness. And Lord, I thank you that before this night is over, you're going to finish the process that you started now. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Come on. Whew. I'm going to give you a second. Come on, we got Kleenex everywhere, across all 18 locations. How was that? Was that a good start? All right, just letting you recover for a second. <laughs> Why don't you guys do this? Across all 18 locations, stand to your feet. V1 Church, I want to honor our guest all the way from Washington State, pastors Vlad and Lana Sopchuk from Hungry Gen Church. Come on. <laughs> All right, we're going to turn it over to them, so give them your undivided attention, guys. Thank you. Thank you. You may be seated. We'll sit down in just a moment. Uh, thank you, Pastor Mike and Pastor Julie. I don't know what we can say after this. I just want to go and cry right now as well. <laughs> this was incredible. How many of you guys really enjoyed this already, this vulnerability? I know that a lot of you who came you already got your money's worth. 
So this, this was just incredible. Um, this is our first time at V1 Church. We are very honored to be here. We are very grateful for the friendship of your pastor and also for um, your team, for what you guys have done already for our church, for Hungry Gen, and even being here this time has been so impactful for us. We've been um, just poured into as uh, pastors, and uh, we're really excited to share just a few thoughts uh, with you guys as well. We've been married for 13 years already. Almost. It's going to be in August, but I'm already started. it. The 13th, once it started, it's already completed in my mind. And so um, we've been married for almost 13 years. We met, we met on Facebook. So you can use a mouse to find a spouse, single people. <laughs> Some of you are fishing with the line. You need to throw the World Wide Web, the, the net. Go with the net. And so, um, and we actually have a book called Single Ready to Mingle in the, in the lobby where you can check it out. It could be a blessing to you. But we, uh, we met and then um, I'll just have my wife pretty much share a little bit of what started to happen in the beginning stages of our marriage. Uh, Pastor Mike, I didn't know you were that bad. I mean, I knew you were bad. Punching, that, punching the wall. Oh, that was worse? <laughs> it, I mean, that was, I was sitting, I was like, I mean, I mean we had demons, but I, I mean, our demons were more domesticated. I mean, we kept... We kept ours in check. <laughs> His were like wild. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Every radical story I had doesn't even come close. I feel good about myself. <laughs> Amen. But if you're taking notes, uh, the statement that we're going to go off of right now, and that is marriage is like a garden where you have to plant seeds, pull out weeds, and kill snakes. So um, those are the three things that we, we want to leave you with today is plant seeds. It's the things that you do that maybe you did in the beginning. Pull out weeds, meaning remove certain things that you're currently doing that are actually killing the passion, killing that marriage. And lastly, and that is you have to kill snakes. And so and my wife is going to start with the snakes. And then I'll do the weeds and the seeds. Yeah. First of all, I just want to say thank you guys so much for having us here. Pastor Mike and Julie, it's such an honor to be here with you. Guys, let's give it up for Pastor Mike and Julie. They are such an honorable pastors. And, uh, yeah, they're psychological jokes. <laughs> really good. Anyways, uh, yes, he already mentioned we have been married for 12 and a half years. <laughs> and guys, I just want to tell you that marriage is a very beautiful thing. If you're going through a hard time in your marriage and it might not feel like that, I just want to tell you that it is a beautiful thing because God created it. And Pastor Mike already said that in the beginning, God created marriage. And we all know that the marriage is under attack, especially in our generation. Our culture deconstruct, deconstructing the, the definition of marriage. And we know that the devil, he hates marriage with passion. Yeah. But I hate the devil more. <laughs> Guys, are you with me? And it's okay to say that. I hate the devil because he, he, the devil wanted to destroy our marriage too. And he is attacking marriages today. And we all know that the foundation of a healthy society is a healthy a family and a healthy marriage. And everything starts with a marriage. And you know that marriage is the only physical expression of Christ's love for the church on this earth. And this is why the devil, from the very beginning, he hates it. He wants to destroy it. And so each one of us as married couples or those of you that are single, you will be married eventually if you want to. You know, God's going to send you a blessed man or a woman of God, right? But, but, but uh, we all will have to or we will have to 
we will encounter and we will have to kill the snakes in our marriage. And some of the snakes that I'm going to mention right now, four of them, and actually we've had... And it's not your spouse. Yes, the snake is not your spouse. It is That's not. That's a revelation for somebody. Yes. Spouse is not the snake. Mm -hmm, come on. We had they to learn that. They might have a snake, but they're not the snake. <laughs> we had to learn that, <laughs> yes. So snake number one is generational curse. Okay, we're gonna, if you are in marriage, and I will share my story a little bit right now. Snake number two is demons, such as demon of rejection, demon of loneliness. And no, lonely, spirit of loneliness is not just if you can't get married. Spirit of loneliness can hit people in marriage. Yeah. They can feel astray from the spouse. And then um, spirit of anger, Pastor Mike punching walls. <laughs> Thank the Lord he delivered us. <laughs> Demon slayer. Uh, pornography and spirit spouses. Uh, snake number three. Strongholds in our mind. And that's why we have to renew our mind. That's what the Bible teaches us. And snake number four is abuse or dealing with the pain of the past. Each one of us, we are... Uh, we will have to or we are dealing with the pain of the past. I hope we are dealing with it. And this is what happened when we got married with Vlad. I had all four, okay, all four snakes that we had to uh, kill. And Vlad had to learn that I am not the snake. <laughs> and you know, the devil is so uh, cunning. He is the snake. And he is convincing. He convinced me that I was that bad person, that I was... Uh, feeling rejected. I was lonely. I was depressed. I was not a good person. I became hateful towards the people. I was jealous of Vlad, even like in the weirdest, smallest things would bother me so much. And I hated myself at the end of the day. Now at that time, we were not exposed or knew that much about spirit realm and spiritual world and all of those things. So the devil convinced me that I was a bad person and I was beyond repair. We, we, we had it bad. I had such a bad nightmares at night that I would like be paralyzed, waking up screaming. No, actually Vlad would wake me up because I was screaming. The devil was tormenting me at night. And then waking up in the morning, that would affect our relationship. It would and affect then, our marriage. And what started to happen is at the age of 24, we got married. I kept myself pure till marriage. So, you know, my wife, she had a past. We get married, you know, I chose not to look at that past, not to ever bring that back. But now I have these problems and the devil begins to plant the seeds. You've made a mistake. You should have waited. Then you should have married somebody else. And so these thoughts were coming. I didn't let them take root, but they were coming. And because of, we didn't do spiritual warfare, yes. so instead of fighting demons, we fought each other. Yes. And at first, I was fighting her, and I said, get better. You know, snap, you know, our favorite uh, pastoral advice is snap out. <laughs> you know, come on. How, how could you do that? We're pastors. You can't just kind of come in into church and acting. You can be hating people. You know, the Bible says, and, you know, throwing the Bible. But the problem is yeah. that when you're dealing genuinely with a spiritual problem, yes. you can't deal it with physical methods. Uh, yeah, that's right. And I think it, it got, one night, I remember, it got so bad that I wanted to actually pack my bags and leave. And I, when I got married, I moved to my husband's town. It was three and a half hours away. So I was so tormented. I was so tired that I'm like, I'm just going to give up and go. And, you know, if you find yourself tonight in a very similar situation and you think, or if you're watching us online right now and you think, you know what, I'm, our marriage is beyond repair or I am beyond repair. I just want to let you know that there is hope, okay? Jesus Christ is the hope for your marriage, for your personal issues and situations. And that's what happened. We uh, started to realize that uh, all marital problems, they are actually rooted more in a spiritual realm than in a natural. You know, the world we live in is very spiritual, but of course our culture, 
does not want to believe that, but that's the reality because the devil hates marriages. And we started to seek spiritual, uh, you know, solution. And I realized a few things that I had a generational curse operating in my life, seeing a few things that were coming through the bloodline. And at a certain time of our marital life, it was it got activated through maybe certain weaknesses or whatever, and, and I started to be tormented. And then I had to deal with my personal um, pain of the past, okay? Some of the things that I have not dealt with that cut up to me. And also, I want to encourage you, if you are a single person, I ask you, please deal with the pain of the past. And this is, the, the, I'll, I'll just give you a um, few practical things or, or uh, on how to deal with the pain of the past. As Lana is um, getting ready to share that, something that at the same time started to happen to me, understanding that spiritual world is real, and I am not just fighting my wife. I'm actually empowering the enemy by fighting my wife. I need to be fighting yes. for my wife, not with my wife. And so that, that changed. I know it's just a cliche. We say that. And... What first started to happen is the Lord started to challenge me, and He said, your number one goal is not to deliver your wife, but to love her. Yes, come on. Because yes. the moment I learned demons are real, and she has one, or she has a curse, and I was like, that's it. You know, Ten. she's my project <laughs> now, you know. This, this is where I, you know, get my stripes. This is my lion and the bear, you know, in the wilderness. And my wife is the one I will experiment on. And so... <laughs> And you can do so many deliverance sessions on your spouse. And after a while, you can get very frustrated with, you know, her or why she's not responding in a particular way. And the Lord really started to change my heart. And He said that, you know, I didn't call you. Nowhere in, in the Bible did I call you to deliver your wife. He said, in fact, I took her. We went together for deliverance to other ministers. But at home. I was her husband, not her demon slayer. Because that's what she needed more. When the curse was yes. broken, the strongholds, the curse was broken right away. The strongholds, it took a while to break that. And this is where the Lord had to teach me also to be the husband that I, I was very selfish. I was very self-righteous. And I thought because I was a virgin on the, you know, our wedding night, that somehow it may, gave me a right to be uh, rude. Uh, to be nasty and to be impatient and so and that sanctification I mean I, I went through a lot of brokenness as well where I cared less about my image in front of the church but more about who I am to my wife outside of that yes and what's interesting actually when he became be, uh, when he started to change in the approach towards me and what I was dealing personally and helping me instead of becoming my enemy, we realize we only have one enemy, and that's not each other, that's the devil. And when he started to come on board and kind of seeing that, this is when I actually had more strength to fight for myself and for my freedom. So if you're a husband or a wife, you have a spouse that is dealing with these situations, don't make them your enemy. Make them your friend battling against the real enemy who is the devil. And so dealing uh, with the pain of the past, don't blame it, but battle it. Many times when you, you realize, okay, it's a generational curse, don't start the blame game. Blaming your parents, your uh, grandparents, you know, it, it might not have begun even with them. It might not have been their fault. So don't just, don't play a blame game. Just take that information, you know, I have a curse, let me just break it in Jesus' name. Come on, come on, come on. Don't medicate it with drugs, sex, or other uh, things. Don't motivate it by working yourself to death, yeah. and don't med meditate it by thinking about it all the time. But what you should do with the pain of the past is face it, which is you're recognizing that in yourself that this has happened, okay? Then forgive the people who hurt you, and that is huge. And it, it can be very hard, but releasing forgiveness is crucial. Mm -hmm. Follow Jesus away from it. Mm -hmm. And this is what I had to do. It was painful with dealing with my personal pain of the past. I had to 
push through the pain to follow Jesus. And only the Holy Spirit and His presence healed me. When I would listen to sermons about the Holy Spirit, experiencing His presence on my physical body, this is when I felt like layer by layer, He would take the pain off of me. He would take, cleanse me. He would purify me. He would heal my hurts. And the last one is uh, seek professional help. And that is um, crucial as well. Come on. Thank you. Um, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, and this is the verse that Jesus, this is the reference Jesus used when he was asked about divorce. Um, and I'm going to read this in a second, but I just want to speak to single people for just a moment. The idea that you can find a spouse the Bible way, don't, bring, don't find a spouse biblically. Because one person found a spouse by killing the husband and married his wife. The other one found an attractive prisoner of war, brought her home, shaved her head, trimmed her nails, changed her clothes, and now she became his, according to Deuteronomy 21. Uh, some actually laid hold of a virgin who was not betrothed to another man and then gave her father a sum of money. Some found a prostitute and married her like Hosea. Moses just went and found a guy with seven daughters, impressed him by watering his flock, and married the wife. One purchased a real estate and got a woman as part of the deal. <laughs> One agreed to work for seven years in exchange for woman's hand in marriage, got tricked into marrying the wrong woman, then worked for another seven years and found out that he now has two. One went and just killed 200 people and married the daughter. And so if you look at the Bible... Um, if some pastor tells you there's a biblical way to find a spouse, you don't want that. You will be in jail. <laughs> so you may say, so which way then? Genesis way. Jesus said, in the beginning. Everything in the first three chapters, two chapters of Genesis is God's way. Third, after third chapter, everything is bad. So you do not want to get cues after Genesis 3. In Genesis 2 and Genesis 1, for those of you that are single, I want you to notice that God created a man and a woman. That means that a marriage is between a man and a woman. We have to say that nowadays. <laughs> Secondly, the Bible says that God gave Adam the idea that he was alone, which tells me, if you keep telling God you're alone, something's wrong. Adam was so lost in God's presence without having another human being that he never realized he was alone. It was God who had to remind him. And if you are 17 and you're telling God you're alone, you're not alone, you are lonely, and that does not get fixed by dating, that needs something deeper that needs to be fixed. So... And when God gave, when God gave Adam, okay, when God gave, I wasn't sure how to, it brought the table so I feel obligated to sit on and stand by it. When God gave Adam uh, the assignment, we're okay? Yeah. My, 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 she said to go sit down. All right. Let me go sit down. We can take the table, yeah. Pastor Julie says sit I down. I want to be like I said, Pastor yeah. Julie and Mike. And when God said to Adam, you're alone, and then the Bible says it was not found for Abraham, for, for Adam. And the, the word found indicates that after Adam discovered he needs to find someone, he went searching. Now, his options were very limited. Monkeys. Um, and if you're single... Before we touch the married people, if you're single, it's very important to understand that before the devil will bring you an Eve, before God will bring you an Eve, before God will bring you the right person, you will typically find the wrong one first. And Adam did not bring to God someone to fix. 
This is when you know the person that you're talking with right now is the wrong one if they're already part of your intercession group. Prayer list. I know he's smoking, but he's hot. He's smoking hot. And you must understand that hell is hot too. You don't want to go there. And so I want to encourage you not to settle for someone for God to fix. It's better to wait for someone for God who already got fixed. Now, when you hear our stories, you're like, oh, yeah, this would be a great part of sanctification for us. We're sharing this so you can start with where we're ending. And then the Bible says that Adam honestly came to God and said, Lord, I couldn't find anybody. And then the Lord brought him somebody that God prepared for him. So we just wanted to encourage those of you that are in that process of pursuit that you, you wait on God's timing. And it's better to wait for God to bring the right person than to wait for God to fix the wrong person you brought to God instead of waiting for God to bring the right person. You're going to wait regardless. It's better to wait in that stage. Amen? So Adam gets married to his wife, Eve, and then God gives him this instruction. And this is, I would say, honestly, it's a blueprint for every marriage. It's been a blueprint. It's, it's been a place where I go all the time. I check my marriage through this filter, and that is Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. It's interesting that from the beginning, God does place more emphasis on a man than a woman. It's important to notice that. They are equal. Men and women are equal in dignity, in value, and in worth. But we are not equal in responsibility. I know our culture washed gender roles now. But scripturally speaking, if you are a man, it does not matter if you are a pastor or maybe you're not even super spiritual, the, there's more weight that is placed on you. I want you to notice it does not say if a woman leaves her father and mother. If a man leaves, a man pursues, and then they, not just him, but they become one. And I see that in this verse, marriage has three principles. Leave cleave, and become. So if you're taking notes, write this down. Leave speaks of priority. Cleave speaks of pursuit. And become speaks of the process. So leave meaning, now, of course, the little application means that don't live with your parents, you know, move out of your parents' house. And that's completely fine. There's nothing wrong with that unless you're broke and your parents have an extra room. And for a season, you can move in. There's nothing wrong. We, we lived with our parents for two months in their sauna, actually, before they finished a sauna because we were remodeling. So uh, probably my parents are watching. Thank you, mom and dad, for letting us stay in the sauna. <laughs> and so we lived there for a little bit. And but leaving for a husband and also for a wife speaks deeper, I believe, principle is not just make sure you leave your father and your mother. For some people, your father and your mother is your golf. For some people, your father, your mother could be a social media, meaning a marriage will never work until you leave something. You can't experience the benefits of marriage still enjoying the benefits of being a bachelor. Something has to give. Something has to be sacrificed. Look at our Savior. He left heaven before he could find his bride. So there, there could be no cleaving without leaving. And when we are dating, it comes very naturally. We're willing to, 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 to burn the whole world to the ground just so we can finally secure this relationship. And then when we get married, things just get a little bit uh, different. And so a um, few things for me that I had to leave is honestly being able to be independent, not having anybody to tell me what to do. Uh, I was a youth pastor already when I got married, and so I had my own world that I lived and protected and secured, and now there's somebody else that I have to consult, somebody else whose feelings I have to consider, somebody else who I have to wait for them to get on board, and it became very frustrating to the point that I wanted to still live like a single man, but just enjoy the benefits of a married life. And that's where it just doesn't work. 
the second principle of marriage and that is pursue. Again, you don't have to teach a guy to pursue a girl when they are dating. But somehow this guy, when he gets married, he becomes dumb. <laughs> and when I say a guy, I mean myself as well. Like, lazy. And, uh, and ladies, it's something, if you are single right now and the guy is not pursuing you, it's not because he has a personality problem. He doesn't like you. I'm going to tell you one thing about guys. If they like something, they will slide on the mountain of razors. <laughs> Swim through the sea of lemon. They will sweat through, shake, and even if they're shy, chronically shy, nervous, that's how I was. And they will find a way to let you know they're obsessed and they only think about you. And if that guy does not have that, I can t and if you feel it already, you're not even married yet, run. Yeah. <laughs> Why? Because the Bible says a man pursues. Now, the problem happens is when you get married, it's interesting, Jesus says that, also repeats this verse, he says, a man shall leave his father and his mother, and a man pursues his wife. And I remember one time the Lord rebuked me, he said, any boy can pursue a girlfriend. Only a man pursues his wife. Pursuing comes easy when you are dating. Because guys are driven by a goal. I'm a, I'm a goal-oriented guy. And when I didn't have her, she was my goal. And so when I got her, she became my trophy. Which means I'm available to pursue other goals. Not talking about the women. Other things like ministry, success, and blessings. So now my wife goes on the award shelf while I'm trying to fill the shelf with other things. And this where the Lord started to work with my heart, you know, and my wife would remind me because she would complain about it. And I remember she said, when we were dating, you always send me emojis. And I was like, we're straight True to the story. point right now. I was like, and, and I remembered, I was like, oh my goodness, you're right. There were more, in, I was a lot more intentional in communicating. Um, you know, the flowers, the being intentional, opening the car doors. You know, they say there's two reasons why a guy opens a door to a, um, to, to a lady. And first one is because it's a new car. <laughs> or secondly, it's a new wife. <laughs> so, and I had to kind of, and those things came hard for me because in the beginning it was easy. Then when we got married, I started to become lazy. I became, started to take my wife more for granted. Didn't do anything bad, but I just, I became super focused into the ministry. And, and I was hoping that she would just understand that I'm serving Jesus and my pursuit of Jesus she'll compensate for lack of my pursuit of her. But women only feel loved when they're pursued. And that's, that's a scary truth. When a woman is not pursued, she's not loved. And when she doesn't feel loved as a guy, it's just wrong. And so it's, just, it's not something that the Lord wants us to do. Anything you would like to add to that before I hit number three? Okay. Keep dropping. And, and the third one, and that is leave, cleave. And the scripture says, and so you will become. The becoming part is the process of becoming one. In the beginning when we were married, my goal is for the one, for her to be like me. So we will become the one, meaning my wife will be like me. And I'm the great man of God. I'm anointed. And, and usually so, it's the one whose personality is stronger, <laughs> pulling on themselves. Yeah, so like I grew up, I had certain habits and I believe they were divine, like clean, like super clean. Um, like obsessed cleaning. Yeah. Um, I had extreme, um, you know, waking up very early in the morning, fasting. Like, there's a lot of other stuff. So I'm thinking, you know, I, I meet this, you know, woman. I'm thinking I'm not going to disciple her as well. And part of my discipleship, and I will conform her into my likeness and my image. We will become who? One, meaning like me. Because I've been prepared for this. She doesn't realize, even though she's a pastor's daughter, but, you know, she hasn't met the real men of God yet. 
I'm the man of God. And she's going to become like me. You know, opposites, they attract, and then the opposites attack in marriage. And, oh, this was so painful, such a painful lesson that I had to learn that the Lord did not give me an anointing to make my wife Vlad female version. <laughs> my wife is not like me. And I then, when I realized I couldn't change her, then I shamed her. So I would come after my, you know, pray for two hours. After I woke up at five and at seven o'clock, I'm already, I'm back home. And not only I did my devotions, not only I prayed, I went to the gym already. I come in and I remember this particular time and my wife is just waking up. And I was like, how dare you? And I was like, it's just seven o'clock. And I was like, what are you doing? And I was like, come on. When are you going to really step up? When are we going to do this together? And so, and then I started to really, because my goal is to make her into a morning person. And then, you know, I would do, and this is just, or same thing as I, I'm very conscious of how much everything costs in the beginning stages of our marriage because we were very poor. And so I went to the store and I don't buy things until I look at the price. My wife buys things, brings them home, and then she checks the price. <laughs> and so... And I would say, hey, how much did this? She's like, oh, wait, let me check. <laughs> and I was like, you, she's like, it's quality. And I was like, I'm not Bill Gates. We don't afford, we're not afford, we can't afford quality and stuff. We, we look at the price and so, and fights. How many fights we had over that in the beginning stages of our marriage? But again, mainly because I believe that her way was wrong way. And my assignment is to make us into one, meaning I need to bring her from the left to the right lane. And she keeps dodging me and just moving further and further from me in that regard. And so, and then the Lord gave me this very powerful revelation that she is a flower and flowers don't grow by being pulled. They only grow by being watered. And it was a, it's not anywhere in the Bible, but it really brought a change in my perspective that God did not ask my wife to be like me. She asked me to help her to be more like her. And then with time, what started to happen is I became more generous. She became more conscious of what she was buying. I started to sleep in a little bit more. She started to wake up a little bit earlier. And what started to happen is I became more like her she's becoming more like me and I started to notice this this is the process of becoming one where both of you shift and change in becoming one three things I would mention if you're writing this down in becoming one in becoming one the three things that will hinder you from becoming one number one and that is lack of commitment Number two is bad communication. And number three is bad conflict resolution. Number one is lack of commitment. But the moment you encounter these frictions, you know there's four, wedding ring, four rings in the marriage. There's the engagement ring, the wedding ring, wedding ring and then there's the suffering. <laughs> and then the moment you wear that one, then you get another one called enduring. It's also a ring that you have to wear. And when you go through this season of frictions and learning to adjust, what begins to happen if you're not careful, if you have a contract mentality, and what is a contract? Contract is this, is I safeguard my interest. Um, I limit my responsibilities. And that means it's really about me. Covenant, which is where we get our commitment from is this is a safeguard your interests I increase my responsibilities so in our decision we made this how we protect our commitment is that we don't use word divorce in a heated argument our marriage is permanent therefore all of our problems are temporary if your marriage is temporary all of your problems are permanent because statistics says your second marriage is going to be worse than your first one. You will 
the chance of you getting divorced on the second one is actually goes higher 10%, I think 10% each marriage. You would think we would learn the lesson. Why? Because you have a permanent problem. And that needs to be resolved by making first marriage permanent. Now, does that mean that there's absolutely no loophole for divorce? This is not what this conference is about. What we're talking right now about is this, is that if you begin to make your marriage permanent and you don't see any other way except forward, and instead of things get hard and you threaten with divorce, in our mind we made a decision. We will never use word divorce. Death, that's different. I'm just kidding. <laughs> like uh, they asked Billy Graham's wife, they said, have you ever thought about divorcing Billy? And he, she said, no, murder many times. <laughs> So divorce is not an option for us. We burned that bridge long time ago. Another thing is we don't bring our past into the future. And sometimes one spouse has an argument and doesn't have a lot of ammunition during this particular argument because the other spouse seems to have all the stuff. So what you do is you pull ammunition from like the other seasons of your life. Well, you were, before we were married, you were dating. Whoa, whoa, what does this have to do with like the fact that you didn't wash the dishes? But because... Your argument doesn't have a lot of solid evidence. You're bringing in stuff from the previous season, and that's called cheating. And so, and we really made a decision we will not do that. The second thing is our communication. And this is hard for me because for me, communication is telling what to do. And, and if I am not telling what to do as a leader, then if she's telling me her feelings, I don't even wait for her to finish it. I say, who caused this? Who did it? And then I'm already texting trying to solve the problem. And so I'm a solver, I'm not, and this manager caused her so much pain, and she came crying. And I'm literally planning, thinking about every guy that just recently got saved, but still hasn't lost all of his mafia contacts. <laughs> so she's talking, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm like, Jose could still actually reach out to Pablo. Uh, I'm like, do they still have the MS-13 in town? I think they, okay. I was, and I, I'm literally, forgive me, but when my wife is being abused verbally by her manager, I'm thinking, I don't have to do it. I just know people who still are not fully sanctified. They will not find that manager's body. And so I'm, I'm outraged, and I was like, let's go fix it. Let's go talk to him. And my wife's like, wait, I'm not telling you this to do that. And I said, what do you mean? He's going to do exactly the same thing tomorrow. I was like, woman, we need to fix the problem. We need to cover the leak. And she's like, I just need you to, to understand me. And I was like, so that he could do the same thing tomorrow so I can understand you again tomorrow? I was like, it doesn't make sense. She's like, well, God wants us to love our enemies. So I was like, yeah, that's in the Old T New Testament. I was like, we're dealing with a different enemy. This enemy needs to be dealt with. And communication comes hard. And sometimes my wife, she grabs me and she says, listen. She says, listen to understand. <laughs> she's like, listen to understand. And and that's, that's harder. And the third one, and that is um, what blocks are becoming, and that is conflict resolution. And I just have one example on, on that one, is that in the beginning stages of our marriage, we fought like, have you seen street fights? No rules. I, so I've been involved in the Ukraine in few street fights. There's no rules. The, the only one rule is use whatever you have at your disposal Make sure the other person doesn't fight back. That's really street fights. And that's how we fought in our marriage. We used everything at our disposal, not physically though. So make sure that I win the argument. And then we learned as we start growing older in the Lord and start growing more mature, we started to recognize that we have to have, have you seen boxing? Boxing is a sport. It's not a street fighting. There are rules. Certain places you can't hit. After certain times you can't fight. And we started to implement very simple rules. One of them is that we won't raise our voice. Number two is that we will not raise our hands. Number three, we will never say never and always in an argument. You never, because if one time I did not do never, the word never doesn't apply. And those words, they engulf the argument bigger than actually it is. And then we implemented a few other things that helped us to kind of de-escalate the situation and fight. Instead of saying we will never fight, we said we want to fight better. So the goal is not we don't want to fight. If you're not fighting, you're not close. Or it means you're not different, but we want to fight better. That's good. Is there anything you want to add to that before we pray?
So we plant the seeds, we pull the weeds, and we kill the snakes. And how we plant the seeds is we pursue each other. How we pull the weeds, we walk away from certain things that need to be walked away. And then we become and we kill the snakes. I want us to pray right now. Amen. Was this helpful for somebody? Amen. I want to ask if the team can put out the marriage e-course. We actually released one today. Marriage e-course. And it's free of charge, so it, it costs nothing. You can actually download it, use it in your small group. It talks about purpose of marriage, understanding the differences, his needs, her needs, covenant, priority, pursuit, role, spiritual warfare, don't control your spouse, communication, sex, and love language. And you can check that out. Uh, vladschool.com. And so I'm just going to give you a little plug in. I get nothing from it, but it's just going to be really a great blessing to your life. What I wanted to take a moment right now is I want my wife first to begin to pray for those people who have spiritual attacks. And I know this is not a deliverance night, but God still can deliver right there where you're sitting, right there where you are watching in those 18 campuses. The spirit spouse can just literally leave right now. That, that demonic attack can be broken right now. So we just want to pray. If you're, if you're a man and you're dealing maybe with anger, you're dealing with that snake. And for those of you who, I want you to grab your spouse's hand right now. Maybe you've been attacking your spouse instead of helping them attack the real enemy. We're not saying to blame the devil. We're saying to battle the devil. Do it together. Uh, maybe loneliness and you just simply, you know, constantly attacking your spouse. Say, come on, grow out of it. Come on, snap out of it. You know, why don't you feel better? And you, you throw in these things that are just not practical. This person is bleeding. This person is like telling a person, you know, that's crippled. Hey, can you run faster and push them to run faster? No, they need to first regain the use of their legs. They need to regain their freedom. So we want to pray for that first. And then I want to pray for the seeds, for those of us who maybe got lazy instead of pursuing our spouse. Maybe we got... We brought things into our marriage that need to be left alone. Or maybe in the process, we got so discouraged and these frictions that we fell up. We, we, we're fighting dirty. We're fighting like a street fight. We're not, we're, we don't have rules in our, in our fights. And we need to change that today. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you right now, Lord. And I pray for every single person right now and those that are watching in every single campus. Lord, I pray for everyone that is struggling with those snakes in their marriage, Lord. I pray that you will begin your delivering yes, work, Lord. Jesus. Yes, Precious God. Holy Spirit, I pray that you will touch them just where they are. Yes, Lord. I come against every demonic spirit that's dividing that marriage in Jesus' yes. name. I come against every spirit spouse that's tormenting that lady or that man in the mighty name of Jesus. I come against every demon that is trying to destroy that marriage through generational curse in Jesus' mighty Amen. name. I rebuke you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. In the mighty name of Jesus, precious Holy Spirit, I pray that you will touch your people. Touch your people, Lord. You see every single person, every single need that they're presenting before you right now, Lord. You are miraculous, God. And we believe in your miraculous good hand. Touch them, precious Holy Spirit. I pray for people, Lord, that are trying to heal the pain of the past. Precious Holy Spirit, I pray that they find themselves in your presence, that they find themselves in your precious presence, and you will begin the work, God, that you will heal their hearts, Lord, and those broken pieces, they will begin to become one. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray, Lord. Lord, we pray right now, first and foremost, for all the singles. Lord, I pray for that single person right now that is, is conflicted. They have this insurance, this gut feeling that they're making a wrong decision. And there are counselors and then there's mentors in their life that are warning them, but they have this strong attachment and they have a fear that they'll never find somebody else. Lord, I pray that you will guide them right now out of things that are not in your will. Lord, I pray that as you put them maybe even to sleep in this season of their life, that you will work on them and that you will prepare them for what you have prepared for them. In the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, I ask you right now for those men in this room who gotten lazy. For those husbands, Lord, who have stopped pursuing and we have treated our marriage as a trophy on the shelf. 
and while we're just putting all of our passion, all of our hours, our weekends, and putting in overtime so that we can climb the ladder of success in our generation. I pray, God, that we will begin to reevaluate, that we will begin to be obedient to your word, which is to love our spouse as you love us. Lord, I pray right now for those spouses who maybe have felt neglected, those wives who felt rejected, felt isolated, and they've started to reach out to DMs on Instagram or Facebook or, or WhatsApp or, or their old flames. God, I pray that you will begin to bring them back, Lord, to this marriage. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just break right now every emotional affair. That, that unhindered and on that deep connection that these people are beginning maybe to feel with somebody else of opposite sex. We pray right now that you would begin to bring just the freedom from that, Lord. Repentance from that today, Lord, in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray for those, God, who are needing to regain, like Pastor Mike and Julie was mentioning, Lord, to go back. Lord, that they will go back to those desires, go back to those passions, those words, and those first acts that we did, Lord, in Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray right now for those that don't have a battle plan. They don't have a way to fight that's clean and honoring and in a way that brings them closer to you, Lord. But their fighting is in the way that they, that they constantly lose the fruit of the Spirit. They constantly cause a harm and reinforce generational curses. Lord, we pray that that gets broken tonight. We pray as they hear the truth, the truth will set them free. And Lord, that they will go home, that they will, on the way back home, that they will apologize. On the way back home, they will say, we must set guardrails. We must set boundaries. We must not speak like this anymore. Lord, that they will hold each other accountable on their way to righteousness and holiness and certification in being who you call them to be. We bless marriages in this room. We bless single people in the rooms across the United States right now and even other nations that are watching us via live stream and via other campuses in in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on. Everybody, would you just stand up to your feet across all locations right now? We're going to do something very, very special. Uh, how good has this been already? Come on, you're going to have to do better than that. How good has this been already? While you're still on your feet, we're going to do something special where we're actually going to jump into a Q&A, but V1 Miami, we have Harvey and Jess that are going to lead that panel, and so we're going to cut over to you guys, and then in Indiana, we have Chase and Haley Fleeman, our campus pastors, who are going to lead that panel. So uh, for Miami and Indiana, we're going to release you guys to have a great time there locally in the building. We love you guys, and we'll see you on the flip side here in a little bit, but here in New York and all the other locations, while you're still on your feet because we're a church that believes in honor. I wanted you to help me welcome our V1 NYC campus pastors, Eddie and Jocelyn Perez. And help me welcome our V1 Long Island campus pastors, Patrick and Natalie. Come out. Give it up one more time for Pastors Vlad and Lana. What an incredible session. All right, all right. Everybody take your seat. We're going to jump into it. And I am going to... Go ahead, Jules. Right there, right there. I was like, I didn't know how close we were going to be, but praise God. Um, okay, so this Q&A is going to be very, very powerful because we've got a lot of anointing here on this stage and listen, we love V1 at Indiana. We love V1 Miami, but come on, somebody. <laughs> we got an all-star squad here, so we're going to let them do their thing. But um, when I was putting together this event and just praying and saying, God, what do you want us to deal with? Can't you see how, like, without even realizing it, our session's already connected? Isn't it amazing what God's doing? So I want to deal with the top five questions that plague marriages. And so you, you will have encountered one or more of the things that we're going to talk about right now. And we've got a panel of experts. You guys are experts now. Did you know that? I didn't know that. <laughs> Lana said I didn't know that. But, but here's the thing. You're an expert when you stay in it. You're an expert when you refuse to give up. You're an expert if you survive to see another day in your marriage. 
And so we're going to have wisdom that is imparted from each one of these marriages here. We're just going to jump into the first question. And I was laughing reading these because it took me back to a different season in my marriage. And so anybody can, you know, kind of jump on these questions. We're going to try to get through all five of them with the time that we have allotted. But, uh, you know, how many of you believe that we have to deal with the supernatural, but we also have to uh, deal with the super practical? Because you don't float into your room and float out. Some of you think that you're prophetic Jedis that can move objects with Holy Ghost force. And, you know, you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. But, you know, there's no amount of prophesying and speaking in tongues that's going to get the dishes done. You got to load them in the machine, you know, or scrub them off. And so we want to deal with the supernatural and we want to deal with the super practical. And if you come from a family like mine, you've mainly only seen the wrong way to do things. And so you may not have the wisdom. And so we're here to impart that wisdom. So I'm going to, the first question is this, uh, how do you decide how free time is spent in a way that does not cause conflict? Because one of, the, one of the things when you get married is you say, I want to go do this thing, and I have free time I want to spend, and then it starts World War III. And it's funny because when you're dating, it's like, oh, he's, he's out with the guys. You know, oh, she's just doing her thing, you know. And then when you get married, sometimes it's how you spend your free time that can cause the, the greatest conflict. So how do any of the couples here negotiate free time? While they're waiting, we're very boring, so it's very simple for us. Um, I usually let Lana do what she wants to do. She lets me do, but of course, for us, we always try to go on our days off, have a coffee together, and have lunch, but we don't have any other, we're weirdos, we don't actually don't have hobbies, (laughs) and um, yeah, so we just kind of (laughs) boring. (laughs) We just stay home, go with walk for, with the dog, and if she wants to do this, I'm very easy going, and and if yeah, so that's. So Vlad's wisdom I is uh, don't have a life. <laughs> that's why I'm, we came to New York. <laughs> to find never it. boring. Yeah, I feel like I had a lot of hobbies when we got married. And so I feel like I did all these the wrong way. So, like, I didn't ask him. I just would go. My hobby at the time was, like, running on Saturday. And I would Which run is disgusting. For hours and hours and hours. And, like, with groups. And I would do gym thing or whatever. And don't be looking at me. I haven't done it in a while. Okay? Back up. Back up. We ain't talking about that now. But, um, so, in our marriage, he would, like, wake up and be like, where are you? And I'm like... I'm on She's the like, trail. I'm on mile 36. I'm like, that's demonic. <laughs> the righteous don't run from anything. Yeah. He's like, when are you going to be back? I'm like, I don't know, an hour, two hours? He's she like, would oh, do my God. Like three and we did it every runs, Saturday. Like three-hour runs on a Saturday. It was, okay, we're not bragging okay. about me, but you It was you traumatizing can. to can. me. <laughs> but we had this way where we didn't ask permission for anything from each other, and we had to really change that. And so I think how it looks like now is, hey, what are your plans this week? And we have a Google, this is just practical. There is nothing spiritual about this. I'm going to tell you right now. We have a Google calendar. And if you do something that's not on that calendar, you are in trouble in the Signorelli house (laughs) because that's the only way we can keep tabs on it. And we just give each other permission, but he'll say, you'll say, I need Uh, you know, however many hours or, and you kind of plan, we plan our rest. We plan our fun. We plan. And you got to learn each other though. Yeah. Because, okay, I'm just going to, remember, we're going to be vulnerable. So I'm incredibly introverted. So all this interaction we're having now, it's got me like on a 10, I'm buzzing, but then I'm going to get home tonight and then I'm going to have like sharer's remorse where I'm just like, what did I say? I said that. Why did I say that? That's crazy. Now all these people. And then I'll be laying in the bed like 16, 24, 34. And <laughs> because like this is so against my nature. So I, I have to recharge. But Julie, she comes alive around people. So if Julie's like feeling low, if I get her around people, she's like, oh, everybody, yeah, this is awesome. And so while she's doing that, I'm looking at her, and I'm just like, she is crazy, and all these other people are crazy, and I don't even like people. 
So I used to just disappear because I needed to recharge, and we had to start getting really intentional about that, and it would negatively affect our marriage if I didn't get a chance to recharge and shut everything down and refuel and take that time. And so what would happen was Julie would get triggered thinking, well, he doesn't want to be around me. He doesn't want to be with me. But it was my time away that made the higher quality time when I was in. And so... What's that? I took it as a rejection. Yeah, she used to take it as rejection when I'm like, no, I'm just reading a book in solitude in Borders uh, right now. It has nothing to do with you. I just can't, you know. And I'm like, read it out loud in my ear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's like a real conversation. <laughs> just come over and just read it out loud. It's like, you're nasty and I'm tired. <laughs> I'm tired. So it's, and you you guys are laughing, but these were major arguments, major arguments. And I, and so now it's my time away that actually increases my time in. And so it's quality, not quantity, because you could be around each other all the time and it's a very low quality interaction. I don't know. Maybe this is the Holy Ghost and I'll cut over to you guys, but get off your phone when you're with each other. Say it. I said he's so good at that. He is. He is. He'll be like, "Why are you on your phone?" I'm like, "I don't know. Well, I just did it." She, so, <laughs> so I'd be like, "So out. you want me to not be alone, reading a book, recharging, so I could sit next to you and watch you scroll?" I want to be on our phones together. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it was. Well, can't we just scroll next to each other? You know, yeah. Some of you guys, isn't this romantic? You scroll, I scroll, we all scroll my people tonight. I found <laughs> this is my side over here. Y'all throwing plates. I'm with this side. I'm with the phone. quiet this intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> but, but hold on, hold on, because I want to turn it over to this side. Of the, but what I'm saying, though, is some of you guys, your memory of your legacy is going to be you holding a phone. And I'll put it like this. When you were dating, you were not trying to hold a phone. You were trying to hold something else. And you need to, if you, let me put it like this. If you got a phone in your hand, there's something else you don't have in your hand. And, and listen, uh, <laughs> marriage is a hands-free device. <laughs> you need both hands available for a good marriage. And so I would encourage you, put the phone down. And quantity, or quality over quantity. And Julie, I, I want to give Julie a shout out. She did, you know, start trying to invest in having better conversations and asking me good questions. And because I'm one of those nerds where it's like, I want to have like a, you know, not all men are cliche. Some men actually need like conversation and connection. And I don't know if any men here feel like that, but okay, yeah, there's one. All the rest are like, no, just take your clothes off, girl. We don't need to talk about it, but there's another guy. So for me, it was like, you know, for Julie, it's like, man, I just want to talk to you. I want to. And so we kind of worked on that stuff. Um, So how we spend that free time matters. What do you guys say about how you spend time? And you want to add anything or you want to move on? Uh, Well, for me, I'm a lot like Pastor Julie, being around people, keep me alive. Pastor Eddie is more of give me a book and I am satisfied. And so it works for us. (laughs) I hang out with my friends, but when we were first married, it didn't always work that way. I wanted to be hanging out with my friends and sometimes with him, and he wanted to play video games. And that wasn't time spent I appreciated. And thank God he was delivered from video games. I'm sorry for for anybody that loves video games. Um, But it just, it just, we just started to learn each other. And as we started to learn each other and we were able to give each other space, but then one of our main rules is on Fridays is our day. So if I have plans with my friends, I can't plan it on Fridays because that's our day. That's our time together. Yeah, Yeah, I love that. So you're intentional about when you do spend time together every Friday. And what are you, a Call of Duty guy or what? What, what? (laughs) Let me tell you, I got healed from a lot of that. So I don't... (laughs) That, that demon of PlayStation is gone <laughs> and delivered. That's right. So, <laughs> but that, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but no, to be honest with you, um, there's a fifth ring, okay? Discovering. And that's what I had to read. Oh, come on. 
Come on. Yeah. Say it. Okay. Come on. Drop that mic. Hold on. That's good. That's good. I think I do have a <laughs> Let me break out my concordance and let me see if I got one. Um, no, but I had, to, I had to rediscover my wife again oh, wow. because I've occupied so much of my time doing things that were meaningless, mm. right? And that free time, and, and here's the thing about free time. I think we got to just kind of change that wording a little bit because free time for men, the, an idle mind becomes the devil's playground, straight up. So for us, when, when men think about free time, automatically you guys say, well, I'm going to go play golf. I'm going to go hang out, you know, with my boys in the bar or whatever the case is. But for me and someone that's become, understands what a regenerate person is, has the Holy Spirit living inside of them, uh, 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 free time means this is my free time right here. Whether you like it or not, we're we, we going to do it. We're going to spend the time, baby, you know? So anyway. That is so good. That is so good. Well, did you guys want to say something? You want to move to the next question? Well, or? my free time is, you know, Pastor Patrick loves to watch sport. I don't play any sport, and I don't watch any sport. So I'll pull him into binge-watching crime dramas. <laughs> you, you had him watching you know, dramas? <laughs> you, crime dramas. Crime dramas. You, listen, you learn a lot from those shows. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'll be using words, and I'm like, hey, that's egregious. She's got <laughs> So I love to watch crime dramas, and he's beginning to love to watch it, but, our, you know, he loves it. He secretly loves it. He loves it. I mean. <laughs> I like how he didn't even get a microphone for this session. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I'll, yeah, I'll be speaking on behalf of him tonight. Yeah, oh my he God. loves crime dramas. He loves baking. He, lo <laughs> he loves giving massages. <laughs> well, 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 for me, I, I'm, man, I'm, I'm an outdoor guy. I'm, he speaks. I'm, man, Natalie got he speaks. Again. I'm an outdoor guy. I really love, I, I love sport, right? So let me tell you a cool sport story. So I love sport. And I play in the summertime. I play in the summer league. And... Um, but Natalie wants, to, you know, we talk about this is this is a tension now <laughs> of what do we do to a spare time. So I love to play sport. Natalie doesn't like sport. Natalie doesn't go to no game or nothing. And um, so I would just do my thing. I'm going to sport and I'm going to play. Then and but I, you know, one one day I came home and and um, there was no dinner and there was no Natalie. <laughs> <laughs> I was like. So I text her and say, what happened? Where, where, where are you? Well, I'm, I had something to eat, and I'm hanging out with my friends. And that was when I had to recalibrate. Yeah. I had to find balance. And I retired two times after that. <laughs> and, this, and this season... She saw me pick up at my gears again this season. She said, what are you going to do? I said, no, nah, I'm just getting my knocks in. You know, nothing's going to happen. I'm going to retire. But um, one of the things I learned about that is, and Pastor Mike is, man, just, you know, it's not that I like to watch what you like to watch. <laughs> but I realized that we get to do something together. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, come yeah. on, somebody's scoring points. He may not be playing sports, but the guy is scoring goals. Now, listen, because we're simulcasting across eight lo 18 locations, we have thousands upon thousands of, of people joining us right now. We are in a timeline for this segment. And I want to make sure that when we jump back into Indiana and Miami, we just say, oh, I'm sure your guys' was great. You know, ours was I ate. But for the sake of time, I want to make sure that we move through all five of these, right? So we may not get to everybody to answer every question, but let's try to see with this time remaining if we can do the other five. Because just free time has been good. Here's the next one. Uh, well, my wife is asking for mercy, but I think I might cut to her next. What's your wisdom concerning finances in the marriage? Do you want to confess? Well... <laughs> Did I God mean, put you and Pastor Lana together for yeah. accountability partners? I know. I, I, uh, yeah, this is an area where I'm growing. 
screen right in front of you. We've been married almost 20 yeah. years. She's growing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm growing. I'm growing. I like to have fun, you know? And so I'm working on it. All right, next. <laughs> okay, so... YOLO. We're going <laughs> to... Yeah. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Exactly. I'm kidding. Ladies, just please ignore me. It's fine. Husbands, I'm sorry. So we have a personal financial advisor, and he's not only over our church accounts and my business accounts, but also our personal account. And the Bible says that if you're a faithful steward with little, that God will entrust you with much. And so especially being a pastor of a thriving, growing ministry, I think it's important that a non-blood-related third-party person is in my bank account, yeah. Yeah. so that way I can't even make stuff up or lie. I think you guys would agree it's a good idea for a lead pastor. And so we brought this guy into our finances, and he's still in our bank account, and he sees every single purchase. How embarrassing. So there's definitely Y'all, been financial meetings where he's like, I'm trying one. to understand why McDonald's happened three times you guys did the breakfast menu, then the lunch, and then the... Okay, now you lie, and now, now you lie, and now you lie. But, but we've had to have a lot of critical conversations, and to be honest with you, we're still growing in that area because... I'm still growing. <laughs> You're good. She's being real. <laughs> Thank you, Jules. Being but, honest. <laughs> but you know what's funny? There was a season when I was addicted to alcohol where I blew all of our money on an addiction. Then when I got healed and restored, now I'm the one that's over the finances, and there's a grace for me because when she says YOLO, she's the generous one. And so sometimes God has to provoke me to come her way. And not only does she spend all of my money, but she also gives it away. Yeah. And, and, and I love that. When we did our biggest offering at the end of the last year, 2022, my wife gave a, 100% of a year's worth of her finances in that offering. Mm-hmm. And so on one hand, I could be so mad about, you know, the fact that mm-hmm. she's spending all the money and she won't stick to our budget no matter how many times I have Dave Ramsey actually reading it every morning. <laughs> and he's texting me saying, Mike, what is she doing? I'm like, Dave, I don't know. Come over and help me. <laughs> and I remember our financial advisor literally said to Julie, I need you to imagine that you've been banished from the garden. And then you try to go back to the garden, but there's angels with flaming swords. That's what's going to happen with your debit card if you don't stop what you're doing. Like, you're going to go to swipe it. And these are real conversations. Yeah, but I'll also say, like, a few weeks ago, though, for real, I got healing ahead of this because we had talked about this. Well, we always get, are on our I best behavior two weeks before the I marriage got conference. Yes, yes. We want to come in it's full spicy, authority. You know what I mean? No, I'm just kidding. But, um, no, I had already gotten healing because what I had realized, and we talked about this, was that, I was feeling like my life is hard. I'm giving so much. And so what serves me is, you know, picking up that meal from Uber Eats, like not cooking. Ladies, are you with me? Are you, you hear me? So like, I, you know, I'm praying for people. I mean, there's times when I'm like, oh my gosh, I got off of Zoom. It's 9 p.m. My kids haven't ate dinner yet. Are you kidding me? I mean, this is real life, right? I'm not showing you the highlight reel. You can watch that on Instagram with somebody else's pastor or whatever. But, like, I'm just telling it to you straight. I was lonely and hurt. And so I felt like it was due to me. Like, this money is going to make my life easier, you know, in this area. And we're not talking about, like, I ain't buying name brand stuff. My pants are from Ross, okay? Like, we're this, but I'm talking about convenience. You know what I'm saying? So a few weeks ago, I was like, hey, I'm going to be a good girl now. And I've been so good. You have been. I have. We're going to be able to drive home today. I just wanted to be transparent and give the But sometimes the wife you'll kill your future in yeah. the name of convenience. And when, and when like, we talk about vision, you know, it's like Julie and I had vision to be homeowners in New York City. That vision actually happened last month. We had Aww. vision. So sometimes, like, we got to fight for the right thing. And so yeah. don't kill your future for the sake of convenience. Right. Does anybody want to throw anything in about finances? Please. <laughs> I guess uh, I'll share the way we uh, deal with money in our marriage. Um, We both have uh, full-time jobs. We work. And um, I have my money, which uh, Vlad's like, okay, you keep your money fully, do whatever you want, give him away, throw it away, spend it all at once. He does not care. And then we have our money. Whatever he earns is ours. (laughs) (laughs) I like this. But I like this. It's cr- 
I'm going to tell you why. Because I always had problems with shipments that were coming from Amazon. So, and my wife, she has an addiction, and that's a, uh, it's, it's not a snake. We, at first I thought it was a snake. She, she said it, it, it's supposed to help her, and it's shoes. And so she buys shoes regularly, and so, um, and so we had arguments about that before, and then what I realized is that we can solve those arguments. Actually, it was one very famous uh, pastor who mentioned that to me. And so we gave her, I gave her the she money, meaning that whatever the she works, she can spend. It's not for food. It's not for essentials. Just pretty much whatever she wants to do with it. And so, um, and then she can buy whatever. She can buy shoes for all of it. And I do not have a right to complain about it. And so, and then we have our money together where pretty much my money, but it's just our money. Yes, it's our money. And sometimes, sometimes it happens. So even last month, I, I'm not bragging. I'm just saying, you know, I help, I give my money away, and then I have to, have to dip into our money. <laughs> and he's like, what is this? I mean, babe, I'm generous. <laughs> But anyways, uh, we actually had a, such a huge shift with Vlad. You know, when we just got married, he was very stingy, man. And frugal. He calls it frugal. But he was stingy. But then the Lord changed him. I am not joking, guys. I'm this not is sure backfiring. why you're laughing. <laughs> this is real. This is real. He became such a generous man that I cannot recognize him. I was like, I am blown away. I'm like, you care so much yeah. for me that you're willing to just like, you know, he's the guy who likes to have finances in control, to lose that control yeah. just so, you know, he can make me happy. Like to me, that spoke such a huge value. Okay. Yeah. It's so good. That's so good. It's so good. Uh, he's he's, he's, he's still a little disappointed over it. <laughs> me too. Me too. Well, I manage our finance. I manage our finance, and I'm very frugal too. So there's nothing wrong with it. Patrick loves to spend. And I always tell him, like, listen, if we're going to make this work, sometimes you really got to ask or tell me when you're going to do it so we could, you know, put it in the budget. Because Patrick likes to go off the budget. <laughs> so I manage the finance. And you respect that, you know. Sometimes, you know, when you have conversation with, you know, men and stuff like that, they'll say, how do you let your wife manage the finance? And he's like, because it's easy. She's good at it. And he's like, it's not a control thing. It's not she's, you know, she tells me what to spend or how to spend. But when it works, it works. Yep. And this is what we got from this. It's like each one of them has a strength. Like Julie provokes me to generosity, and then I provoke her to actually stewardship. And so we each have to lean into the direction of our strengths, and we're better together. Amen? So I want to, Julie's been dying to talk about oh, this. No. She's, you the have The housework been. one's boring. Yeah, I know. I'll, I'll <laughs> skip to the one that you want to talk about. She wants to talk about physical intimacy. I told you, you guys are my people. Okay, so we, here's the question, because we don't have a lot of time. How do you face the problems in this area? And I know that many of us here have problems in the area of physical intimacy. You wanted to tell a story that you oh, thought. No, no. That, yes, you, <laughs> you, you told me I want to tell this story. It's funny. It'll be, this is the wrong I'm session. Did I read your text wrong? Well, I promise you, she said, this would be great. It's funny. It doesn't funny. fit here. It doesn't fit here. Oh, it doesn't? Here. Well, now we have to. I can't tell it. I can't. You're going to have to tell that one. Go ahead. <laughs> you got to discuss things. <laughs> like volume levels. <laughs> was it when I was telling you be quiet because the kids are around? Okay, let's talk about it. <laughs> Can we talk about it? Nothing will throw a wet blanket on your romance than having children. <laughs> And there's two types of people in a marriage. One, that they can actually, like, act, tune it out. 
Like, they, the kids be like, I hate you. And then the, this is Julie like, come on, baby, bring it. And I'm like, you don't hear that? Like, are they okay? Do we need to call an ambulance? What's going on? I can't even focus. She's like, no, you just look me in the eyes. You just, you stay right here. Is this the story you don't want me to tell? This side is my people. <laughs> I'm just and kidding. I I'm love thinking you guys. in my mind, like, is this permanently scarring here. my children to experience <laughs> this through these thin walls of a New York City apartment? I ran a daycare for a lot of years, and so the sound level for me is, you know, are you moms, can you tune it out? All right, that's all I need. So a problem for one is not a problem for other, and vice versa. So these are just things. But we always say this, the, the most powerful sex organ that you have is not between your legs. It's between your ears. It's your brain. That's why even as teenagers, and I'm talking to some of the men, you know, our, some of us, our first experience with an orgasm was, and I'm going to get canceled off of YouTube right now. Uh, this is not meeting the guidelines, but it was actually during our sleep without any physical touch because your mind is so powerful. And so it's possible that the problem that you have is not below the waist. It's actually between the ears. And so one of the biggest things that you need to work on is the mental in this area. So for me and her, we've had to have a lot of very vulnerable conversations. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything you want to add to that now that I'm thoroughly no, I'm embarrassed? I'm done. After the money and that, I'm good. <laughs> I'm out. But something that we had made an intention to tell you guys is that if you experience the passion before, you can experience it again. And if it was good, it can be good again, and it can be better. You know, I'll never forget uh, attending classes for the Kinsey Sex Research Institute, which is in Bloomington, Indiana. It's the largest sex education research center in the entire world. And I took classes there for my undergraduate, and I remember them saying that the most sexually satisfied people on the planet, according to all of their research over decades, was actually um, married people, male and female. And I remember thinking, isn't that God's plan? And what they said is what's more sexually satisfying over time is actually a monogamous marriage with an opposite gender for a lifetime. And that is the best sex that you can have on the planet. So don't believe what they show you in the movies. Don't believe what they try to sell you through OnlyFans because I'm only a fan of marriage. I'm only a fan of fidelity. I'm only a fan of my wife blowing my mind in a way that none of y'all could do it. Because if you'll learn how to communicate, and maybe some of them do need to get loud in the bedroom. They need to say, this is what I want. This is how I want it. This is where I want it. Do that again. Don't do that again, but do that again. Do that longer. Do that more. And maybe what will begin to happen is you'll unlock what God destined for your sexuality, and you can't find it in the club. You got to get it in your own bedroom. Yeah. Any, any of you guys want to talk about? Let's talk about I'm not. <laughs> Here's the recipe that, that can help each and every one of you. I want you all to do this tonight. Can we, I want this. I want to make it a practice. Uh-oh. <laughs> Jocelyn is, what has no idea. Jocelyn is like, what you are we doing? You just unleash the beast, baby. You better be are careful Are we playing now. PlayStation? <laughs> is that code for PlayStation? <laughs> We're going to go into bed. <laughs> We're going to put on PlayStation. I'm not going to do that. We're going to... If you both go into bed together and read Song of Solomon, you will have a joyful marriage. <laughs> Simple. See, seriously. Read Song of Solomon line by line. Guys, you could even read it in a deep, sexy tone. <laughs> the Lord. <laughs> I can't go there. It's the, the hills of your... No, we're not going to go there. But, you know, but to, to be real honest, just one minute... Um, I was actually a semi-pro bodybuilder, and I was so fixated on my body that it, it caused so much pride. And it, it, it distorted my view of my wife. And, it got, and, and I had to get to a point of looking at her, and literally your brain, I had to reorient my brain in such a way to see the image of God in her. So that's, that's something that that helped me through the years and just saying, you know, I, I'm looking at you. You're my Eve. You're my rib. Literally. <laughs> like, you know, and I had to literally see Christ inside of her. And that changed my perspective. 
And now we read Song of Solomon every night before bed. So I, mean, I, I queued it up actually. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. This would be what you read to me, Joel. For your love is better than wine. Your anointing oils are fragrant. Your name is oil pour. Therefore, virgins love you. Draw me after you. Let us run. See, there's running in the but let us run. The king has brought me into his chambers. Okay. It works. It you works. know what's funny, though? I was saying this. Men watch porn, but women read it. And it's because women are, are wired for that communication. And so there has to be that, even the conversation talking about sex, Julie loves to text about it. <laughs> Talk about send me emojis. And those are little down trouble. payments on You're my in future. <laughs> okay, let's I'm move done. on. Because let's I'm move done. on. Let's move on. She can't get enough, y'all. <laughs> you know what, though? We were saying this the other night on, on the YouTube broadcast we did. A lot of times when, when because this needs to be said. Yeah. Because this is an area of our greatest brokenness, but our greatest freedom as well. And a lot of times when, when a man comes to me and he was like, man, my wife, we fight all the time. We're always at each other's throat. Like, she's always nagging me, da, da, da. The first thing I think now is you do not know how to make love to your wife. Because if you really know how to make love to your wife, all that nagging just decreases. There's some things they just forget to even ask you to do. <laughs> There's some things they suddenly don't care about. And the more I started winning in the bedroom, I started winning in many other departments. And y'all think I'm joking. I haven't asked you to do a dish in years. <laughs> I remember a day where the dishes never got asked to me again. Never I don't even again. have to take the garbage out. My mom, Julie, like, I'll go ahead and take that it. garbage out. I got out. it. Because what you it. just did was worth a thousand <laughs> garbages being taken out. What you just earned is 40,000 dishes. And you all think I'm playing. You think I'm not. Like, My wife is such a witch. That is sexual tension. You need to relieve it. And then you see how much complaining and arguing happens. Because she's like, I ain't trying to mess anything up. He's my best friend. I'll tell you what. So let's see if we could get to this in the last few moments. Um, what is the proper place for, ext by the way, that was for real. When I know it's I'm joking, but that is where, where I mean, sex does something in your relationship that reduces or even eliminates many other problems. And a lot of times I used to think that me and her were having emotional conversations and I realized it literally was, no, she need, we need to have sex. And I know that sounds like I'm joking, but there, she needed to feel close. She needed to feel treasured. She needed to feel connected. She needed to feel safe. And then once that happened, all that other stuff, I was like, wow. There was two, there was two, I'm going to give, all, this is all my men. I'm going to give you two secrets. Number one, find out her favorite snacks and always have them with you. And number two, learn what she wants as sexual pleasure and get real good at it. What I just taught you is how to go to the next level. And you think I'm playing. If it can't be solved with food, it can be solved with sexual pleasure. If it can't be solved with sexual pleasure, it can be solved with food. And if both those fail, then you just take it to Jesus. <laughs> Last question. <laughs> That's funny. And if Miami and, and Indiana is joining us right now, welcome. <laughs> how do you deal with the proper place for extended family in your marriage? This is the last one, extended family in the marriage. How do you deal with that? Anybody want to jump in? Because I know that there are some mother-in-laws that are not mother-in-loves. I'll kick it off on a high note. Go I ahead, have girl. the best in-laws. They are. Yes, they are. Come on, Mama Moses. And I have, um, Mike has the best siblings, and they have brought so much joy into my life. And I think we've learned along the way as the years have went, like how to do life together. Um, but I would say I, I want to create a family where my kids' spouses love to be around me. So I want to sow that into them. I feel like every time we laugh, every time we get an opportunity, I wish there were more, like to bless them or to, it's like I'm sowing in a field I want to reap in in another season. So women... 
Don't be, um, if you have sons especially, treat your mother-in-law the way that you want their wives to treat you in another season. I don't have sons, but I'm just throwing that out there. I'm married to one. (laughs) Anybody want to speak into extended family? I think for us, um, Natalie, um, you know, when I met Natalie, um, you know, she didn't have the great relationship with her mom. So, so, um, you know, it it, it was a little bit awkward, um, you know, like the awkward family, you know, Christmas. Um, You can go onto the V1 app and you can see it for Christmas. (laughs) And um, so it's just very awkward for us, and um, you know, just you know, just watching the tension between Natalie and her mom, you know. And, and I remember just saying saying to her one time, I said, "Hey, this thing is going to um, just fester itself into our kids' relationship, and one day we may be on the receiving end of what's happening now." And I said, I remember saying to her, "How about we just build a relationship with boundaries?" And I think once we clarify those boundaries and establish those boundaries, I think we now have one of the, you know, the greatest relationship with, with, with her. I mean, at least for me. Wow. <laughs> no, we, we now have an okay relationship. <laughs> because I learned that you have to love with a line. And even though she's my... Say it again. Yeah, you have to love with a line. And even though she's my biological mom... Sometimes, you know, I, you know, I used to, honestly, I used to, I brought Patrick into, you know, my, my family, and I didn't really get along with her too much, and I used to just, like, we'd be having a conversation, I'll literally just curse her out, and just hang the phone upon her, and just, like, we can't do this, and then one day, Patrick said to me, he's like, you know, what you're doing is cursing our marriage, you're cursing our seed, you're cursing our future, because the Bible does not just you can't go against the Bible it doesn't violate itself for you and if God says you have to honor your parents you have to honor your parents so what I learned to do is instead of always cursing her out or saying the wrong things to her I would say mom can we talk about it another time so instead of hanging up the phone I'll be like yeah we'll talk about it later so I learned to stop being disrespectful to her and honestly I started watching the glory of God over marriage and it was amazing it was it was. And I, but, you know, I learned so the hard much. way because I couldn't understand what was happening in our marriage. You know, we have been married for 26 years. We've been good together. But we could not, you know, we couldn't understand that part that was just like out of line. You know, and it was because I was, you know, I wasn't right with my mom. I was cursing her out. I was going against, you know, one of the commandments, be obedient. And that I had to learn the hard way. Wow. Um, Baptism is this Sunday, um, so you can get rebaptized. <laughs> <laughs> you know, would you guys, I don't know if the media team can put that picture of the living room back up real quick. I don't know if that's possible. But I just want to take a moment for me. I'm just going to have a selfish moment right now because I'm looking at this, these couches. And for those of you who call V1 Church your home church, I was thinking about how rare it is to have these conversations. And for many of us in living rooms is where we experience the tragedy. In living rooms is where the brokenness occurred. In living rooms is where the fighting happened. In living rooms, you know, couches where where sexual abuse happened. Couches are where arguments happen. Living room was, some of you are triggered even by a living room. But the living room is also where the glory of the Lord can come down. And it's in the same place. See, Jesus was not resurrected in China. He was resurrected in the very same place he was crucified on, because man. the same people who watched him die had to watch him resurrected to know that it was true. And so in the very same place that you're hurt, that's where you'll be healed. And so God asked me, Mike, would you bring the world into the living room? Because it's the living room where the seeds were sown of destruction. It was in the living room where the perversion happened. It was in the living room. And so I just want to honor all of you, all of the pastors, because you're serving each campus so well. And and it's such a rare thing to be this vulnerable because married folks don't ever share 
And they're ne- they never get this vulnerable, so you don't get these conversations because everyone wants to front and act like everyone's got it together. Yeah. So I want to honor you guys, yes. and I want to thank you for creating this global living room right now. Can we just do that and just honor them for being this vulnerable? And so we're going to transition off of the panel, and so I'm going to dismiss all the panel members, and uh, we're going to do something special right now. Can you guys put your hands together for them one more time? As we continue this journey of healing, uh, welcome back V1 Miami and V1 uh, Indiana. You know, we're a multi-generational church. And so you've been able to hear from different ages and different races. You've been able to hear from people from different regions and geographic locations. And the Lord gave me a vision for tonight that we would actually hear from Gen Z. And uh, Gen Z, it, God is lifting up Gen Z. Uh, Asbury College is actively in revival right now. Matter of fact, we just got word that it it spread to Lee University, and I believe that revival is spreading. For those of you who attend V1 Church, we are in the seventh year of our revival, and uh, we're living it, right? And we've been believing that that was going to happen. And so I had asked a couple of Gen Z from our church, and by the way, I just want to give a special shout out. This entire front row here is filled with the V1 youth leaders, both in New York City and Long Island. We have V1 Indiana youth leaders, and they're doing such a good job. And they've been uh, raising up our teenagers in righteousness and, and godliness and in the word. And so we asked a couple of Gen Z a question. And I believe that this is also going to be a healing moment because we ended that last question on honoring your mother and father. And I know a lot of times teenagers get a bad rap because we talk about rebellion. But I actually believe that it's not always rebellion. Sometimes there's righteousness there too. And so we, I asked Gen Z from our church, from V1 Youth, I said, I, I want you to tell us some things that you've observed uh, from your parents' marriage that as a teenager in 2023, you see value in it, and you think it's something that if you could tell 18 locations full of people, like, do this in your marriage, these are the things that, that you should do. And so uh, this, I've never been to a marriage conference where they've let Gen Z say anything, but I do know that the apostles said, don't despise the youth. And so we're a church that believes in giving voice to, to even the youth because there's something they're seeing. And, uh, and so we have some experts on marriage who aren't married yet in Gen Z, but they see the marriage of their parents and we want to give them an opportunity to share. So can we welcome our Gen Z here? Um... <laughs> <laughs> They're so cute. You're like little humans. So cute. <laughs> I mean, the cutest. They are so awesome. They're so cool. They dress me and everything. They pick up my wardrobe. And so um, in no particular order, we want to just take the next three to five minutes and give you guys a chance as Gen Z. So just introduce yourself, maybe shout out your parents, and then just uh, I'm trying to help them out. And, and shout out your parents, and then, and then just share with the world right now, what are some things you see in your parents' marriage that you wish the world would know? I'm the son, I'm the son of uh, Pastor Eddie and Pastor Jocelyn. <laughs> shout out to them. And just to the world, I want to say what I really see in their marriage just I want to point this out. They really have it's really valued their time and the way they do things just together. Like like they said before on Fridays, uh, you know, today's Friday right now. <laughs> so they're spending some time together already. <laughs> but, you know, they really, they ha- I never noticed it throughout my life, but they really value their time. And it's not, it's hard to realize, but they really value it in just every moment. It's great. So... Thank you. <laughs> oh, that's so good. And you know, there's a seed that your parents sowed into you. And so this is where it becomes legacy. Because for you, the Friday nights, you're going to want to repeat that pattern. And so when you get married, and you know, there's a, maybe, maybe she's watching now, and that'll be your story, you know? <laughs> the first time I've seen them. But you know, you, because we're either repeating failures or we're repeating the victories. Yeah. 
And so it's like a victory for you becomes a victory for the next generation. And so you, you didn't just, your parents don't just have Friday nights that are sacred. Now your Friday nights are sacred for the marriage you don't even have yet. Isn't that amazing? Come on, somebody. Good job. Um, my name is Michaela, and my parents... <laughs> My parents are Evelyn and Alexi. So something that I've observed about their marriage that I want the world to know is definitely the power of a praying woman. So growing up, I saw my father struggle in trying to follow God, but also getting caught up in life and 40 hour work weeks and providing for his family. But my mom never gave up on praying for him. And slowly but surely, God began to work his way into his heart and his heart softened. And his mannerisms and towards us just completely changed and God found his way into his heart and to this day, he's still changing him. And now he comes to church every Sunday. <laughs> so, Come on, you guys can do better than that. Are you kidding me? Hallelujah! So seeing the perseverance of a praying woman for her husband was really encouraging, and knowing that she never lost faith in my father was really one of the most beautiful things that I got to experience. Wow. And by the way, I see them on the front row at V1 NYC every Sunday, and I love watching him worship because he's actually got swagger. So he's just like, worshiping. I'm like, man, he looks so cool every Sunday. Well, now, now you know the secret because he's my, every Sunday he's just praising. I'm like, man, he's got swagger when he worships. Hi, my name's Bella. <laughs> I, I am their daughter. <laughs> Shocker. <laughs> um, I'm just so honored to be up here tonight. And can we give it up for Michaela and Elijah? Because, like, they killed it. Um, I would like to open up tonight in some scripture. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Mark 10, verse 9. You know, in every situation and circumstance we've been in, my parents have always done it together. When we moved to New York, they did it as a team because they knew the calling for them to leave was greater than the calling for them to stay. God chose them to lead this generation in revival, and they said yes together. I really love their ability to have so much faith in one another that it drives them to say yes to anything that God throws at them. And their marriage has taught me as a Gen Z to remain faithful through every battle and pursue the dreams that God has planted in me. So today I encourage you to have faith in your mindset. Er, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> so today I encourage you to have a faith mindset in every relationship in your life. Staying faithful in your mindset is staying faithful in your marriage. Oh, tear jerker. So good. Well, okay. as a church, you know, you guys represent Gen Z and V1 youth, and I just want to let you know that um, God is going to honor your faithfulness for tonight, and you seed, you sowed many seeds, and then there's going to be those that water it, and then there's going to be a harvest. And so just continue to be faithful to the Lord, because you guys are reaching the nations through your obedience. Come on, guys, let's give it up for them. Thank you. All right, welcome back, everybody. Oh, <laughs> oh, extra credit. Somebody make him an elder. You just got a title. Dude, take <laughs> all my money. just got promoted. That's what happens. <laughs> Give all my money. Uh, tonight has um, really been an incredible night. This is actually our last session. Didn't it go by too fast? Way too fast. And um, we're, we're going to do get ready for this last session. Um, and so I want you to begin to prepare your hearts. But before we do that, we're going to hear from somebody. Just, just hold on. Just hold on. Um, but, you know, I want to share my heart before he comes up. And then we're going to go into this last and final session. You know, a lot of times we have these experiences. We have Pastor Vlad and Lana who came all the way across country from the West Coast to the East Coast. 
I'm getting pictures and video from Toronto, and, and actually we had almost 20 people sign up just weeks ago on Vision Sunday to actually become missionaries to Toronto, Canada, and physically move there to begin to break hard ground and be- believe for V1 Toronto. And, and I'm getting video and, and images from Miami where they're filling that place up, and it's just such an incredible thing. But, um, but here's the thing, you know, this is the experience, but we want to also take you on a journey. And, and so my biggest encouragement for you is that this is not the final step. This is just the first step. And we want to lead you to take the next step and the next step and the next step because it's, it's a process. And as we're going on this process together, you're going to need people that you borrow their faith. You know, when David, kind of one of the themes tonight is David fighting Goliath. But Dave, did you know that Goliath had brothers? And when David fought one of Goliath's siblings at a certain point, actually David was going to be killed. There was not a grace for that giant. And there was this man named Abishai. And Abishai came and joined David and began to kill that giant on David's behalf. And so sometimes you're David, but sometimes you're Abishai. And sometimes you need to actually kill something for somebody else. You get what I'm saying? You need to say like, hey, you lost faith for your marriage, but I did not lose vision and faith for you. And that's why you come together. And, and sometimes you need an Abishai where you're like, man, I, we've gotten victories in the past, but I just can't see it anymore. I just can't do it anymore. And you need an Abishai. So really what V1 Church is, we're all giant killers, but we, you can't always kill every giant. And so Abishai will come alongside of you. When Julie and I, when we were going through that, uh, we went through a separation 15 years ago. And I was struggling with alcohol. And my wife left me. I remember I came home so drunk that I actually thought she cleaned the house really well. And it wasn't until I woke up the next day that, and, and was sober enough to realize she, she didn't clean the house. She moved out of the house. And all her stuff is gone. And, and a baby Bella a little baby Bella, she's 16 years old now, so she was just a baby then, um, had, had left my house. And so all these years later, you are watching when my 16-year-old daughter begins to say what she said from that, you're watching the product of a 15-year process. And so sometimes it can be discouraging. I'm just going to be honest with you. You could be in a conference and what's encouragement to one person becomes discouragement to someone else. I'll be honest with you. Like Eddie was a professional bodybuilder. You know, sometimes you can see the the product of the process and it actually causes you to not want to work out because you're like, well, I'll never look like that. And, and so don't look at Bella, my teenage daughter, you know, reading this inspirational thing. And, and don't look at my wife who, um, you know, is talking about our love life and say, man, I want to throw up in my mouth. All that did was discourage me. Because I know there's people that are just as cynical and just as critical as I was in these settings. And so I'm speaking to you. I'm speaking to the person right now that almost three hours in, you haven't cried and you haven't laughed one time because you just want to get out of here. I'm talking to you. Sometimes the layers of depression and discouragement go so deep that even the most anointed, powerful speakers on the planet cannot break through that. So what I'm asking is, listen, we're just real people. And hopefully what happened over the course of this night, and I'm setting you up for just one more chance, is that you can say, listen, my dad, my biological father, guys, he committed murder, he went to prison, came out of prison, and then he died prematurely. I remember sitting in counseling with Julie and the counselor trying to explain to my wife the depression that Mike experiences and what he's trying to medicate with alcohol is a fatherlessness that's created a hole in his chest that a train can go through. And, he, and, and so you're expecting him to have normal conversations, but there's nothing normal about his emotions. You're expecting him to have a healthy marriage, but he's never seen one yet. And so I'm talking to you. I just want you to prepare your heart. There's one more chance tonight to allow yourself to open up. And you know what happens is every other time you tried, it failed. So there's something that's reinforced in you that says, well, you know what? I'm not even going to try again. But here's the word of the Lord to you. One more time. One more time. There's still 
one more chance. There's still one more, and if you'll open up your heart. So we're gonna hear from somebody for a few moments, and then Julie and I are gonna come back, and we're just gonna deliver a word, and then we're gonna do a global vow renewal. We've had people actually buy diamond rings just for tonight because they, they never had the diamond ring experience. And, and I had grown men saying, I bought a diamond ring for tonight because tonight I'm gonna make it right. Wow. We, we've had people that never went through that process who were saying tonight. So this is a big, big moment. And, and, and I believe that for some of you as we do this vow exchange, I believe that strongholds are coming down. Chains are gonna be broken. And I believe you're gonna come out of this place completely free. Come on, praise God. So can you guys help me welcome Pastor Evan Wilson. You know, for all the single people who are going to get dismissed during the vow renewal, he served at these marriage conferences as a single man. I did. And I said, Evan, if you will just be faithful to serve other people's marriages, you yourself will be married. Come on. And not only is he married... He married way out of his league. This is true. Her name's Caitlin. Yes. And then y'all, you at least made love once. At least once. Because we can prove. That you can prove. (laughs) And you have a baby boy, Easton. Yes. Come on, somebody. And so we're celebrating that season of your life. Come on. Go ahead, Pastor Evan. You got the floor. Come on. Can we give it up for our pastors, Pastor Mike and Pastor Julie? Man, are you guys tired yet? No, oh, come on. I think we all need to stand up for a second. Get the blood pumping. Come on, I see you guys in the back. I I need 100% of you guys standing up. Come on, stretch a little bit. Come on. All right, you can sit down. That's all we needed. Man, I just wanna I just wanna reaffirm what Pastor Mike said. This has been an amazing time. Who's been so grateful for the speakers, for the pastors? Who's received something today already? But I want to encourage you, if you have not received your breakthrough yet, this next section that we're getting ready to go into, your breakthrough is coming. Amen. So I want you to prepare your heart. And uh, before we get into that, I want to encourage you. I want each and every single one of you uh, to participate in this next moment because we got a couple surprises for you, all right? So I need you right now, take out your phone. And if you were extra spiritual and you left it in the car for this conference, you can do this later, but I want you guys to take out your phone because we got a couple surprises for you, all right? So I want you guys right now to go into the app store, and I want you to check out the V1 Church app, all right, because we're going to use this to give you guys a surprise. So I want you guys to open that up, search V1 Church for Apple or Android, and you can go ahead and find that. Now, I want to encourage you guys. The V1 Church app is our main discipleship tool, and it's the heart of Pastor Mike and Pastor Julie that this would not just be an event, that this would not just be one night that you attend and you feel all the emotions, but then you go back to your home state, to your home country, and you feel disconnected. And so I want you right now to download that V1 Church app because what that's going to do is that's going to allow you to stay in community. Come on, how many of you know you cannot do life, let alone marriage, alone? Amen? And so I want you guys to download the V1 Church app. That's going to be a place where you can sign up for connect groups. That's going to be a place where you can get together with other married couples, whether in your region or digitally via Zoom, wherever you happen to be tuning in from. And you're going to be able to stay connected. We got Young adults groups, we got men's groups, women's groups. I want you guys to check that out. Sign up for Bible studies. And so I want you guys to check that out and go ahead and download that. And while many of you are downloading that, I want to give honor. I want to give honor to our lead pastors. And I know we just cheered for them, but I want to say this. I'm just going to speak to the elephant in the room right now. Our pastors have such a heart to restore marriages and to sow seeds into single people so they can have fruitful marriages, that they made this event 100% free. Come on, who's grateful for our pastors? That, I mean, that includes venue rental, equipment, everything that you see here, the cameras that are streaming this to 14 revival homes and two revival hubs right now. Come on, somebody. 
And they had a heart to remove all barriers so that you could be here to receive tonight. And so as you're tapping into the V1 Church app, as you've downloaded it, I want to give an opportunity right now because many of you are here and God is taking you into the next level. And one of the ways that he's doing that, he might be calling you to sow a seed right now. And so at the bottom of the V1 Church app, there's a little heart where you can tap give. And for many of you, For many of you, God is calling you out into generosity. God is calling you to sow a seed. I want to encourage somebody right now because like Pastor Mike was saying, for many of you, you might have been here and and you're in a broken marriage. You, You have children that are wayward. I want to encourage you right now, sow a seed in the field that you want to reap in. This is good soil, and so I want to encourage you as you're giving, uh, you can just tap that link. If you're watching live right now, you can tap the link that's pinned in the comments and in the description of this video, and you can give that way. But okay, are you guys still with me? Because I don't, I don't think you guys are ready for this next announcement. I told you that I had a secret. I had a surprise for you. You are hearing this first. The first time that this has been announced publicly This year, V1 Conference 2023 is going down in New Jersey, and I need you guys to get loud right now, because registration is open on the V1 Church app. It is a free conference. If you thought this was powerful, you guys need to register right now in the V1 Church app, because are you ready for this? We are going to have the original demon slayers all together ministering. Pastor Mike, Pastor Vlad, come on somebody, Isaiah Saldivar, Alexander Pagani. This is going to be a historic event and you do not want to miss it. Spots are going to fill up and so you need to reserve your seat. It's going down. And so as you guys are downloading the app, as you're registering, as we prepare to go into the next section... I need you guys to check out this video, and we'll see you on the other side. Many years ago, a God-sized dream was birthed in me. What started with 18 people meeting in a house in New York has turned into a disciple-making movement. We burst out of that original home, and years later, V1 Church is filling hundreds of revival homes weekly. Campuses from Indiana to New York City to Long Island are swelling with true worshipers, and last year we gathered over 1,000 people from around the world for our very first conference. But this year, we believe thousands more will gather, guided by the same voice of the Holy Ghost, at the Wellmont Theater in New Jersey. Why is this gathering so urgent? Because now is the time for the global rising of the breakers. Come on. How many of you believe it's time to take territory back? Come on. Well, I'm excited and we're here with this uh, last session. Um, but I just want to prepare your hearts. We're actually going to pray right now to begin this session and um, just believing for breakthrough. So, Heavenly Father, we call upon you to do only what you can do. This will not be cunning words. This will not be the wisdom of man. This will simply be your spirit, your power, and your might. Father, we will give you all the glory, all the credit, all the honor for what happens in this moment. I ask that you prepare hearts across every single location, God. Lord, that you can take the heart of stone and turn it into a heart of flesh. God, that you can speak into the innermost parts. Lord, that our words cannot get to, but your words will be released into. And Lord, somebody right now needs to know through the Holy Spirit that they did not make a mistake. They did not choose the wrong person, but they are becoming the right person for each other. And Father, I thank you that you would complete what you started in many marriages tonight. In Jesus' name. The thing I want you all to understand 
is that a moment broke you, so a moment will heal you. A moment occurred that caused you to lose your breath. A moment occurred when your stomach just dropped down into your belly. A moment occurred when you felt like you couldn't even breathe and a panic attack was coming over you. A moment happened when somebody said something and when you heard the words of your spouse and you, and you realized that they were capable of that level of depravity, your expectations were destroyed. But if a word hurts you, another word heals you. See, what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna begin to step into that moment. It's a moment that heals a memory. It's a moment that heals a memory. If one moment hurt, another moment heals. And so God will bring you to this place of redemption. See, redemption is what we're talking about right now. It's the same person who cursed you that actually speaks a blessing and begins to prophesy over you. It's the same person who told you you couldn't. It's the same person that empowers you and says, yes, I believe that you can. It's the same person who limited you that has to become the same person that releases you. And so this is what make a moment heal a memory is all about. That this is the marriage ministry of our church. My hands were the hands that hurt Julie. And these are the hands that God redeemed to bring healing to Julie. This tongue, come on, these words, and it's the same vocal cord that begins to speak the words of healing. So right now, the person that can heal you most is not a psychiatrist or a psychologist. Even though God will use them to facilitate moments, the same person that made you afraid is the person that God wants to use to make you feel safe. This is the way of redemption. It was Paul who was killing Christians that God said, I'm calling you to some deep work now. You're gonna die alongside of them. That's redemption. You were the one terrorizing Christians, but now when they see your presence, you'll become a spiritual father that brings peace and comfort to them. This is the way of redemption. Peter, you were swinging the sword and you took the centurion soldier. And you're no longer gonna fight for your life, but you're gonna willfully give it up and you're gonna die crucified upside down because you yeah. honor even the way in which I died. This is the way of redemption. That's it, that's it, that's it. This is the way of redemption. That's it. God wants to use the same person that hurt to be the conduit for healing in your marriage. Yes. This is the way of redemption. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Redemption is countercultural. It's counterfeminism. Redemption doesn't look like how your girlfriends would heal the fracture in your marriage right now. It doesn't look like how your family healed, tried to heal their marriage. Redemption is completely countercultural to everything that the world would try to sell you and how to fix your marriage. Redemption causes your flesh to die. Redemption causes your desires to be put aside. Redemption causes you to be the first. I'm sorry. It may not have been your fault. And here's the countercultural thing, because reason would try to say, well, they need to be the one to say it. But redemption is countercultural. It's counterintuitive to everything that our school systems have taught you about how to do life, about how to fix a family, about how to raise a family. Come on, Jules. It's different than how the culture that you grew up in may have said, you know, how to have an argument or who holds the checkbook or who gets the say so. Redemption goes all the way to the cross without asking a question. Redemption is wholeheartedness and yes, completely. Redemption is undeserved, 
Redemption is undignified. Redemption sometimes looks like humiliation. And I think about Jesus, our Savior, naked, bloodied, beaten, mocked, up on a cross, looked like a fool, and yet bought our redemption. And some of you are saying, I look like a fool in this marriage, but I'm wholeheartedly for the cross. I'm wholeheartedly for redemption, and I'm going to be the redeemer in my relationship. I'm willing to look countercultural. I'm willing to look counterfeminism. I'm willing to look counterintuitive sometimes. I'm going to go all the way for Jesus. The scriptures say, while we were yet sinners, he put his love out on the line with no guarantee that we would accept that sacrifice. While your husband is yet still messing up, you've got to learn how to put your love on the line. While there's no guarantee that it's all going to work out, your love is the guarantee because your love is being molded and fashioned after the love of the Father. A love that holds no records. A love that never gives up. A love that persists through every season. A love that breaks through every barrier. A love that their own mother couldn't give them. A love that their boss and their work, the people in their workplace, it's a love from the throne of God that flows through you. He said, while we were yet sinners, while Mike Signorelli was still drunk, while Julie was still dealing with her dysfunction, he put his love out on the line. This is not a love that says, when you figure it out, then I'll agree to make a commitment. It's a commitment in this moment that says, with no guarantee that it'll ever work out, I can guarantee that the love of the Father will ensure it always works out. Your love fails. His love never fails. Your love is temporary. His love is eternal. Your love is preferential, but his love always prefers you. And so to become like him is to love like him. And then your wife believes in Jesus because she, he, she cannot deny him through you. And when your wife looks you in your eyes, she doesn't see anger. She sees the eyes of her Savior staring through the windows of your soul. And your wife can say, one man hurt me, but God used my husband to heal me. Love throws things away in the world's version of love. They'll say things like, we're breaking up. We'll, we'll say things like, I just, I'm doing away with that relationship. But redemption says, God, I believe you can take all of these broken pieces and put them back together in such a way that no one would ever know it was broken unless I tell them. You've got to tell your story because you don't even wear your story anymore. Because the glory of God shines through your countenance. But the Redeemer is the person who's saying, I'm not waiting for you to say you're sorry for me to actually say I accept your apology. I am going to actually accept your apology before you extend it because I've got the love of the Father inside of me. And I know that many of you have suffered things where you've said, I feel like I look like a fool staying in this relationship. I, I can't even believe I've endured this much. But sometimes we quit too soon. Sometimes we quit right before the breakthrough. Sometimes, sometimes our spouse is already making the decisions to make the change and all they need is just one spark like an ember that starts the fire that burns up everything that's not like God so that finally that refiner's fire can have its way. I see revival hitting marriages in this season. I see husbands rising up and beginning to prophesy boldly in their home. I see husbands washing their wives with the word. And it's so much better than any salon they can go to because on the soulish level, they're saying, man, my, I'm, I'm tasting the honey from the honeycomb of the word that my husband is releasing to me. 
I see wives that sowed in tears, getting ready to reap with joy, and you will laugh again. But this time it will be a joy from the Lord. You, where, where you sowed in tears, you will come in with both your arms full. God is still in the business of opening wombs. God is still in the business of opening wombs. I see adoptions. I see pregnancies. I see multi-generational bloodline curse breakers saying in my family this is the first marriage that will be the marriage that God destined. I see it. Come on, dream with me. I see some prideful men melting like wax before the presence of God who say, I was a male by birth, but now I'm a man by choice. I see women saying, I don't have to bear the burden of, of masculinity because I'm safe within the arms of my husband and I can release the burden. Sometimes we call a woman a Jezebel and I just say, no, she's overburdened. She's trying to do two jobs and I see a heavy burden coming off of women as men say, I'm ready to stand up. I, I see men, men hear me when I say this. When I was praying for this event, the Lord told me to tell the men of this house, they that wait upon the Lord, I will renew their strength. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. I see men not giving their home leftovers, but coming home from work restored and rejuvenated in their bodies because revival in the house looks like a man who's saying, I'm not going to let the world break me. I'm going to keep fighting. Men, you're going to get your fight back tonight. Put your gloves back on. Get back in the ring. Fight for your namesake. Fight for your legacy. Fight for your name. And for those of you men that inherited a last name that meant poverty and shame and meant lack and meant divorce, get ready to fight to change the meaning of your name. When I got the name Signorelli, it meant murderer, it meant, it meant adulterer, it meant fornicator, it meant high on drugs. And, 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 but guess what? In one generation, we got to fight like Jacob that says, I'm not going to let you go, God, until you bless me. I'm not going to release you. And there's something, I'm not even talking. Sometimes you fight the devil, but sometimes you say, God, now I'm wrestling with you. Because I will not have a mediocre marriage. And I see God lighting a fire inside of men. Something stirring out inside of them. Full sexuality. How dare, how dare the world take your sexuality. The Lord is restoring full sexuality. I see men being free in their emotions. I see men being free in their mind. I see revival in marriages. Come on, see it with me. See it with me. See it with me. You're getting your fight back on the inside of you. I see women who are calling out the purposes and plans of God and their spouse. I see women who are going to be um, obedient to the Holy Spirit when they go to say the thing that they are and tell them the thing that they aren't yet. I remember looking at my husband drunk as a skunk sleeping in front of our front door with a newborn so he didn't stumble out and get hit by a car. And I looked at him and I said, you are a global pastor. And he wasn't nothing yet. We don't need more women telling men who they are not. We need more women rising up full of faith and the power of the Holy Spirit to look and call out the greatness in our men. I see women who are full of meekness. Yeah. 
I see women who are full of kindness. I see women who are joyfully raising their children. I see women who are joyfully sowing in the fields of grandchildren. I see women who are getting free of discontent now in the name of Jesus. I see women who have dreamed and fantasized of the next season and the Lord says, I'm restoring your joy. Break that fantasy now in the name of Jesus. And he has joy in this season for you. Joy is your portion, says the Lord. I see women who are getting free of anger. Do y'all hear me? I know we masculinize anger, but how many men have we emasculated with our feminine anger? We've got husbands who are terrified. I see women rising up as a safe space for their husband. I see women getting free of generational anger now in the name of Jesus. Come on, ladies, let's just lay it down. Lord, we lay down that anger. We lay down that pride. See, I know some of y'all thought that you were coming for this throwdown deliverance fest, but what the Lord's saying is, I need a deeper level of commitment. I need a deeper level of the fruits of the Spirit in your life. That stuff is good, and we're going to do that. But this right now, I see women who are crossing over to their next level. I see women who are rising up in power. You know, power isn't necessarily controlling what's around you. Power is sometimes withholding what you could control. And I see women full of power, but yielding full control to the Holy Spirit. Come on. There's some private things that I want to say across all 18 locations with only the married folks. And so as we get ready to transition, if you are single in Miami, Indiana, and here on Long Island, we have a space for you where you can um, mingle. We're going to do Christian mingle in real life. So (laughs) what color are the single people's wristbands? If you have a blue wristband, you are now dismissed from those three auditoriums. And we're, we're going to have some grown folk talk here in the room. And so if you're single, God bless you. Now, we're going to get ready to do the global vow renewal. But I'm going to give you just a few seconds. Let's just do this quickly. And then we're, gonna, we're not even taking a break. We're just letting the single folks t- step out. At each auditorium, you just exit, and then there are going to be greeters that actually help you get to where you're going. Singles, there's enough of you for me to think you're desperate, so you better start running. Run back to that section as fast as you can. And y'all stay in your age groups, you know what I mean? Don't be weird. Don't be weird. I said singles, stay in your age groups. Yeah. All right, let's just take 30 more seconds for the single folks to exit this auditorium. We have quite a few people here. It's just going to take about 30 seconds more. Let's hold the atmosphere, and then we're going to prepare for this vow renewal. While we're waiting for the single people to exit, isn't it funny how what it means to be human is to always want what you don't have? When you're single, you desperately want to be married. Sometimes when you're married, you're like, I wish I was single. 
Isn't that a funny thing? I don't have any other statement about that. <laughs> but you know, some of you, you were in that season where you were single and, are, and you, you had that moment where you're like, man, things are so amazing now. I'm married. It's awesome. And then a little while later, you said, what did I get myself into? Single folks are having too much good times already. Don't glorify it. All right, is that it? It's going to be a little loud as they're working their way out, but okay, let me draw your attention back because we're going to do something interactive right now, but before we do, just take a look at my eyes if you can. Just try to focus on me for a second. As I was praying for this event, I was really going before the Lord because I know for some of you, I will only get one shot. This is like the only chance I get. One of the major things that I felt like God spoke to me about was how many of you have become a person that you never wanted to become. And there's something about false identity in this room right now that I want to deal with because some of you, your spouse perceives you a certain way, but you're really not that person deep down inside. And even as you talk a certain way or act a certain way, there's something inside of you that says, this isn't really me. I don't know how I became this, but I don't want to be this person anymore. And so this moment we're about to create as we go into this global vow renewal is an opportunity for you to take off those identities, to lay those identities down, and you get permission. Now listen, it's very hard to get to these moments where you get permission to become who you really truly feel that you are. And some of you live bitter, but situations and circumstances made you bitter, but you're not a bitter person, and you don't want to be bitter. But unless you allow yourself to release that venom, it will continue to poison you. And sometimes you do, release, you do come to a point of no return. And there are people who are on their deathbed and they've never renounced, they've never released that poison, they've never forgiven. And so right now, this is an opportunity for you to say, I don't have to live like this, I don't have to be this person. I can go back and deal with some things before I move forward. And so before we go to this global vow renewal, here's what we're gonna do all across this auditorium. We're doing this in Miami, Toronto, Indiana, all the other locations. I want you to just turn towards your spouse right now. So just turn towards your spouse. Just kind of sit sideways. This was the moment that your mother and father maybe never had. And it ended in divorce and you inherited that brokenness in your family. This is the moment that maybe your grandparents or your great-grandparents or your great-grandparents, they never got to this moment you're in right now. And if they could have been in this room, if they could have been in this auditorium, if they could be in Portage, Indiana, in this congregation, if they could be in Miami. See, there's something right now, this is a divine appointment. So I'm gonna give all of you, come on, praise God. If you guys can't hear at the other campuses, the single people are all already celebrating. I don't know if there was a spontaneous uh, engagement. <laughs> they took speed dating too fast. They're in there. But, this, but it's good that there's a little bit of noise because here's what we're going to do. Now, there's going to be some very heavy things that happen at all of our campuses. I want to give you a chance to say you're sorry. But here's the condition. I want you to believe your spouse. Don't judge the apology because if they have the courage to get it out of their mouth right now, trust me, it's genuine. If they're willing to say they're sorry in front of a room full of people right now, I don't want you to judge. I want you to receive it because sometimes you'll have a hardened heart and they'll be saying the very thing that you long for them to say, but you'll dismiss it. So we're going to say, I'm going to turn you loose here in a second. Maybe you have not told your spouse how beautiful they are in a long time. And maybe you need to look your spouse in the eyes in this moment and you need to say, you are so beautiful to me. I don't know what it is, 
But I want to give all of you across every campus right now a, a few moments to apologize, to say you're sorry, to say what they truly mean to you. Because w- before we do the vows, I want it to come from your own heart. What they truly mean. Maybe there's some things that you know you should have said, but you haven't said it. This is going to be your moment. So right now, I'm going to stop talking, and I want you to start talking. Maybe it's your physical touch. I don't know what it is, but allow the Holy Spirit to move in you and through you. So right now, across every auditorium, I want you to just begin to make that moment right now. We're going to give you all just a few more moments just to wrap it up a little bit before we do the vow renewal.
I'm going to give you just 30 more seconds, and we're going to do the global vow renewal. I hesitate to do this because I can hear so many conversations happening from front to back. And I know all of our campuses, people are opening up wells of communication that may have been locked up for a long time. I want to encourage you to take this conversation into the car. Then I would encourage you to take this conversation into the bed. And we're going to take our next step right now, okay? So we're going to do this global vow renewal. Shout out to my man, Jose, who's in Northwest Indiana with a diamond ring, who's getting ready to do this moment. And for this global vow renewal, what we're going to do is I'm going to have you repeat the male part. So we're going to have the men say this to their wives. And then Julie is going to lead you through the vow renewal of the wives saying the the vows to their husband. And then we're going to pray over you, okay? And this is a legitimate vow renewal. You know, the Bible talks about the power of the tongue. It's the words have life and death. And actually, it's by words that covenant is established. And God speaks covenant and he speaks words, the law of God on tablets. And so as we begin to speak these words, I believe that something powerful begins to happen. And I believe that God's going to renew and restore some things in your life. And so I want you to just face your wife. And men, just grab both of their hands right now. And I want you to repeat after me, but here's the thing. Men, don't just worry about like saying the words right. I want you to speak these words into your wife's spirit. I want you to make these words your own because it's your your anointing that she needs. And so men, I want you to just repeat after me. Say, on our wedding day, I pledge to you in sickness and in health and for better or worse. Our past has tested those vows, but our enduring love has prevailed. I came here today to make a fresh start, to renew my vows of love honor, and fidelity, and to affirm my love forever for you. You are my wife. Come on, look at her again and say that. You are my wife. I will fight for you. I will pray for you. I will lead you. I trust you with my heart, and I love you. All right, ladies, repeat after me. And I want you to, I know sometimes there can be a lot of hurt. And maybe you're here and you're like, this is the last thing I have in me. But remember, love is a decision. And so I want you to get like, get a yes in your spirit when you do this, if that's you. And just repeat after me. Say, you are my man. Today, I choose you again. I renew my commitment to cheer you on, to celebrate with you, 
and to fight alongside you. I renew my vows to cherish you and to serve you. You are the man of my dreams. I trust you with my heart. Thank you for leading me. I love you. I want to pray over every single marriage right now. Heavenly Father, we ask that you restore the years. God, that you renew their strength as the eagles. God, that this next, this is not a season, this is an era. An era of revival in our marriages. And Father, I thank you that even our children will feel the results of what is done now in this moment. I rebuke every demon that would try to attack right now. By the blood of Jesus, I cancel every assignment of Satan. And we will resist the enemy until he, he learns that he has no place in our lives and our marriages. Father, I thank you that this is a new breed, a peculiar people, a royal priesthood. And Father, I thank you that in all areas, revival, revival, health, in Jesus' mighty name, amen. You may now kiss your bride. <laughs> now save some of those kisses for the ride home, okay? V1 Church, we love you so much. Here's what we're going to do right now. We're celebrating all of the testimonies that happened in this room. I want to encourage you, though. We've got book resources that are in the lobby. Grab a resource on your way out. But here's the thing. I know that seeing Pastor Vlad and I, many of you are like, but my marriage, we need deliverance. Guess what? We got you. This Sunday, across all V1 locations, many of you have dr driven out, you've flown out, you're a day and a half away from receiving prayer and deliverance, so I want to see you Sunday morning across any one of our campuses so we can go deeper, and we're going to personally pray and minister, and we have deliverance teams across all campuses, so we're going to see you just a day and a half from now on Sunday, come together as a family, we cannot wait to see you take your next step, we love you guys so much much. Thank you, thank you, thank you for an amazing 2023 marriage conference. This one's in the books. We love you guys.